We're recording. Please proceed. Thank you. Good evening. It's June 24, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the town council with additional with an additional meeting included in it with the library trustees. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at the meeting location. However, there is a quorum present in the town room tonight. Um, as long as we are able to provide alternative access and we are doing that by Zoom, by phone, and as live broadcast on Amherst Media, Channel 9, and live stream. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the June 24, 2024 regular town council meeting to order at 6.01. And I will call on each of you. Um, please unmute your mic, say yes, and then we'll go back. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devon Gothier is not here at this time. Councilor Ette, not here yet. Lynn Griesmer, present. Councilor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councilor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Oh, she's not here yet. Okay. Uh, Councilor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. Councilor Walker. Here. Thank you, Alicia. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. And if they become so difficult, we will find a way to uh, address that during the meeting. The order is of the agenda is slightly changed in that a discussion item in seven uh, regarding the Jones Library vacancy, question, the questions for the Jones Library candidates will occur now. And while we have a preliminary discussion of the town manager's goals, the full discussion is actually postponed till July 15th. At this time, I'm calling on Austin Surratt, chair of the Jones Library Board of Trustees to call the meeting of the trustees to order and take, take roll. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, this meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees is called to order. Please indicate your, your presence verbally for. Here. Tammy. Tammy didn't hear you. Still can't hear you, Tammy. Jean. Yeah, so okay, here. Tam Tammy, I heard you. Jean? Here. Thank you. Lee? Here. Okay, and I'm Austin. Sarah Lynn, we're all set. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Pam Rooney to just come over, touch the mic, say here, and... I'm here. Thank you, Pam. Um, okay, um, you have um, in the packet tonight and sent to you last, late last week, um, the revised memo for attachments A through D. In addition to that, many of you were quite responsive and submitted questions for possible inclusion. So is my job, whether I've done it well or not, um, it, to try to incorporate those questions into a document that is now attachment E, draft questions. That is the focus of our discussion tonight. Um, I will say up front, I think the 10 questions is probably too many, but uh, let's figure out what we can do with that. And uh, I'd like to start by taking it by sections and see if there are suggestions or changes people would like please use the raise hand function. So the section on the role of the Jones Library trustees, there's three questions there. Several of you did provide questions that asked people to think about the future of libraries. And so I took an average of the number of years and came up with about 20. Um, and then there's also two questions that really relate to the collaboration with both the um, library uh, director and also the fact that library trustees are also um, serve as a board of a private entity, a nonprofit. So are there any questions or comments on that first set of questions? Sarah. 
Lynn, um, this is a professional hazard. I do have some edits, but maybe we come back to that after we have the bigger picture discussion. That's up to you. That's fine. Thank you. We can do that. Okay. Um, all right. So then we're going to go role of all board members. And the, there's two questions there. Councillor Ette, I'm going to ask you to just lean in, say present with your mic, and then we'll continue. Present. Thank you. Austin. Lynn, just uh, you, you think you said you think 10 are too many. So is there do you have a sense of what would be the right number? We've usually tried to shoot for about eight. Okay. Um, you know, if we only have two or three candidates, it's really not that many. But when you start thinking about the fact that each candidate gets one to two minutes to answer each question. So as you go through, if you have 10 questions, an opening statement and a closing statement, that's 34 minutes. No, 20, 20, 20, 30. It's 24 minutes a candidate. Okay, Kathy, you have your hand up. I was going to add, Austin, that if you look at some of the question, there's two parts. Um, so, you know, tell me one good thing. Tell, unless we just want, you know, one word answers to some of these yeses and nos. Um, some of them ask for uh, a longer statement. So that that was the interest of moving it along, in terms of how many. Um, I mean, one of the options that we have is that we wait and see how many candidates we have. We can cut back on the opening statements. We can cut back on the closing statements. And for that matter, we can even say, you know, each question is a minute and a half. Um, all right, then let's go on to number six, strength of and areas for improvement in the Jones Library. Okay, and then current and upcoming issues facing the Jones Library trustees. Councillor Hannig. Um, I think these could co be combined in a way, um, but I also, number eight, the clause at the end seems to put a thumb on the scale of something just in how it's worded. And I don't like that thumb. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like question seven kind of does too, but I understand where seven is coming from. Um, but I, I think I would delete eight and maybe keep seven. <laughs> Okay, are there any other thoughts on that? Kathy? I was gonna ha have the same suggestion. I also think that it's a complex question, number eight, in terms of if you don't have someone who's ever evaluated a major building project, it's kind of a setup. And I thought seven was global enough that they could, if the person has some some thoughts on this, they could speak to them. Okay. Are there any other thoughts on eliminating eight? Bob Hegner. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I concur with eliminating eight, but my concern is that both these questions deal only with the expansion and the renovation project. They don't deal with other issues with the library. And, you know, there, there are many other issues that a library faces. So, um, Perhaps we should get it into like what the role of the library is in the community or something like that. Well, we have that in question one. 
Okay. Please describe your understanding of the role of a public library and the services it should provide to the community now and 20 years in the future. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, that was my thought that okay. it's kind of a narrow focus here. Mm -hmm. Farah? Um, I just wanted to point out, just in terms of what Bob said, we do have and the repair option in seven. So that is covered. Okay. And like Lynn said, the role of the library is covered in one. I, I'm i hearing a consensus that we're eliminating number eight. Okay. Uh, we're going to go on to skills and interests. What additional strengths and skills would you bring? And then also, as you know, trustees serve on a few committees during their time on the board. Which committees do you, you believe most suit your skills? Uh, Farah, you have your hand up still. Oh, sorry. Kathy? This one, I guess, is too long um, when I have to go on four lines to read the question. So if I'm not sure which what we were doing here, you know, do we want to know whether they have any budget analysis skills in, in investment management? So working with my when you um, so it's what additional strengths and skills. So I'm not even sure what we mean by additional that we originally asked them. So, so, so I just would pare it down um, and focus on, do you have any strength skills experience on managing a nonprofit organization, endowments and budgets? You know, I, I would make it shorter. So I'm not sure exactly which words. Um you can get into paring it down. I agree with that. Uh, several people, I will tell you, tell you, did speak particularly to including, um, for example, uh, fiscal management, management and using endowments and investments, uh, working with major building and or repair projects. So I was trying to be inclusive here because I did get a lot of comments regarding those. So I, I think taking the word additional out is probably very appropriate. Um, Councillor Haneke. So yeah, I would take additional out because we don't actually have another question about their skill strengths. <laughs> um, and I would delete the entire parenthetical because that gets to only a portion of strengths or skills that someone might have. And it seems to say, well, this is the kind we're looking for and we're not looking for any other strengths and skills. And I don't like that it, it focuses on just these particular skills when there are many others that can come into play, especially with a board of trustees yep. um, and a, a library in general and a public body and all of that. So I would delete the entire parenthetical and give it, leave it up to the person answering the question to determine what skills they want to highlight. Um, I would delete number 10 completely because, um, and I feel like, Number 10 is not something that we as a council should be weighing in on when we pick a board of a library board of trustee member. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that the six boards of members of the board themselves need to discuss amongst themselves once they have all six there to determine how to set up their own subcommittees and who they should appoint to others. So I feel like this is getting into an area that is much more internal to the board itself than who to appoint. Okay. Austin? Uh, Lynn, I was going to make the same point about number 10. I think it should be, I think, I think it should be deleted. Uh, the okay. people applying may not know what committees the board has. So e even if it was appropriate to ask, you'd have to give them here, here are what our committees are. So I, if, if it could be deleted, I think that would be good. Great. So let me summarize where we are at this point. We've made, we have made no changes in the first section role of the Jones library trustees, the second section role of all board members or the third section strengths of and areas for improvement in Jones in the Jones Library. In the next one, current and upcoming issues facing the Jones Library trustees, we've eliminated question number eight. Under skills and interest, we've eliminated the word additional 
in number nine and everything that is in the parentheses. And then we've eliminated question number 10. That brings us to eight questions with some modifications in the others. Are there other questions, comments? Kathy? Lynn, just so does number nine read what strengths or skills would you bring to the Library Board of Trustees? Question mark? Yes. Good. That I just wanted to. So the everything. Question mark was at the end of the parent. Yeah. You know, so that it's a good question then. I like that because they can say anything in there that's relevant. Thanks. Tammy? Could we add experience? What strength, skills, and experience would you bring? Excellent. Okay. I think that's a good suggestion. And are there other suggestions and other changes? Farah, this would be the time to do any edits that you'd like to suggest. Okay. Um, so for the first, oh, for the second question, I would a rephrase to say the library board of trustees and then continue to say is expected to collaborate with comma and hold accountable comma the library director and then go on to say how would you approach this dual role to achieve the best outcome for the library system All right let me make sure i got that the Let Library me. Board of Trustees is expected to collaborate with, comma, and hold accountable, accountable, comma, the library director, period, right? Yep. Okay. How would you approach this dual role to achieve the best outcome for the library system? Okay. I think I got those. Were okay. There yep. There's Go more. Ahead. I mean, I could send these to you as a Word doc if it's easier. It's better if we come to agreement tonight okay. in public meeting. Okay. A Jones Library trustee also has the dual role for number three and just leave the rest of the sentence as is. Okay. The Library Board of Trustees, the Library Board of Trustees. No, a Jones Library trustee also has the dual role of serving as blah, blah, blah. Okay, a Jones Library trustee also has the dual role of serving. Okay, got it. Or before you go on, I, I think you could drop the phrase dual role, which is replete, repeated in the second question and the third question, and just say the library board, right? Jones yeah. Library trustee, and then just drop out dual role and just say, you know, you do how this, would you approach you this? Correct. Yeah. So also has the role. No, just say, how would you approach this role? I mean, you don't need. Okay. I need to understand. Are we working on question three? Yep. Okay. Tell me what you would like it to say, Farah. So right now, a Jones, it should say a, libra a Jones Library trustee also has the dual role of serving, and then the rest of the sentence continues as is. Mm -hmm. And you would, and the next sentence, I believe what Austin is saying is, how would you approach this role? Is that what no. you're saying, Austin? No, no. So Lynn, let me just provide a different, uh, a Jones, this is for number three, a Jones Library trustee serves as a municipal slash publicly elected official and a board member of a private entity. Oh. How would you approach these responsibilities? That way you're not using the phrase dual role three times in two questions. Got it. So it would say a Jones Library uh, trustee serves as a municipal slash publicly elected official and a board member of a private entity. How would you approach these responsibilities? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, for number four. Yes. I would just say, tell us about your experience collaborating with a group and then continue with the rest of the sentence. Is there general agreement with that? 
she would like to eliminate everything after the comma in number four and just end. Tell us about an experience you no. had collaborating no. with the group. No, no, no. That's not what I said, Lynn. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, tell us about your experience collaborating with the group. And the rest of the sentence is fine, particularly where opinions were in conflict okay. and decisions were controversial. Okay. Tell us about your experience collaborating with the group. Okay. Comma, and then the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, for number five, the second sentence in the second part of that sentence, I would just say, what role can the trustees play? Okay. Um, and the, the section where it says strengths of, I would say strengths of comma and areas for improvement in comma. Okay. And for number seven, I would just say, what are your thoughts on the Jones renovation expansion project and the repair option? I don't think we need to say concerning the Jones renovation expansion. Okay. That's it. All right. Thank you. I'm gonna go through and read them one time. Okay. First one stays the same. Please describe your understanding of the role of a public library and the services it should provide to the community now and 20 years in the future. Number two, the library board of trustees is expected to collaborate with comma and hold accountable comma, the library director period. How would you approach this dual road to achieve the best outcomes for the library system? Three, a, li a Jones library trustee serves as a municipal slash publicly elected official and a board member of a private entity. How would you approach these responsibilities? Question mark. Um, tell us about the experience your, tell us about your experience collaborating, experiences collaborating with a group, particularly where opinions are in conflict. Yes. And decisions are were controversial and or raised criticism from stakeholders. Freke, uh, I, I'm sorry, Councillor Ete, you have your hand up. This is for question two. I think you said this dual role, is dual supposed to be singular or is that plural? Singular. I would say singular. Singular. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pam Rooney, you have your hand up. I think I would go back to the uh, Anne experience, if people don't mind. Um, I could, you know, spend hours talking about my experiences, and we really want to limit them to to one incident. I think, if people are comfortable with that. Okay, so you wanted to read, tell us about an experience you have had collaborating with the group, particularly with, and the, the real goal there is, so the sentence stays the same. The real goal there is to limit them to one experience. Okay, uh, Kathy. I was just gonna say that actually, we'd like to have them tell us about an experience. You know, I mean, it's not just, have you, how have you dealt with this? But give us an example. That's what it's asking for. Yeah, it is asking for an experience, an example. I mean, we could say, tell us about, give us an example of where you have collaborated with a group, particularly where opinions were in conflict. Please provide an example. Please provide an example. where you have collaborated. 
Got it. Uh, Eugene, you have your hand up. I don't want to revisit question number three, but but I'm slightly confused. Is a Jones Library trustee also a member of the the I'm assuming the board member of a private entity, the private entity being the friends of the Jones? I yes. know one of are we yeah. actually members? I it's not like listed it's that not, way. I, no, you know. the, pri the private entity is is the Jones Library Inc. Right. We're not members of the board of the friends. Okay. All right. Okay. That's what I was assuming. Thank you. Uh, the fifth question. The town has com a commitment to end structural racism and achieve equity for all residents. What role can the trustees play to ensure the public library is a partner in upholding these commitments? Next one is in the title, Strength of Comma and Areas for Improvement in Comma, the Jones Library. There's no change to the sentence or the question. Um, under the next area, current and upcoming issues, what are your thoughts about the Jones renovation slash expansion project and the repair option? Um, under skills and interests, what strengths slash skills slash experience would you bring to the Library Board of Trustees question mark and sentence? Austin. Uh, Lynn, thank you for all of that. Um, I just want to actually uh, suggest that there'd be a change made in number two, and I'm sorry I didn't catch this earlier. Mm -hmm. The Board of Library Trustees is expected to collaborate with and to supervise the library director. I think the phrase hold accountable is is a very narrow range of what we do. We supervise. Okay. So it reads... the. It actually had been changed to say yep. the Library Board of Trustees is expected to collaborate with and supervise the library director. Okay. Farah? Yeah. In which case, you don't need the comma after with. Yes, I added that. Yeah. I added two commas and that's no one comma. Thank you. Are there any other changes? Don't need either. I don't need. Thank you. This is getting messy, but that's okay. Are there any other changes? Okay, we have um, come up with eight questions with significant edits. I will make sure those are changed and made available. And the position has been posted. And I just want to remind you so that you encourage people to apply that that posting went up last week and that statements of interest are due to um, the um, to the clerk of the town council on Tuesday, July 9th, 2024 at 4 p.m. And they will then be certified and then packets will be sent out to all of the candidates as well as to the trustees and to the council on July 11th. And we will conduct these interviews on Monday, July 15th at six o'clock PM. Are there any questions? Any further comments? With that, Austin, I'm going to ask you to adjourn the trustees. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, this meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees stands in adjournment. Thank you. We're going to go on to announcements. Um, we'll show them on the screen. And I just want to mention two events coming up on July 30th at 2.30. Uh, there is reception uh, to welcome and congratulate Captain Ting and Press Director Kamala uh, Tariq. And that is at Mill River. June, June. I, did I say July? It's June 30th. I'm Ooh, sorry. The other one, however, is July, and it's July 2nd at 6 o'clock. And that is when the town will celebrate its 4th of July with fireworks, et cetera. And that is at McCork Stadium.
And there is the announcement of that. Note that the rain date for that is Monday, June, July 8th. Okay. Uh, we are going to go on to general public comment. If there's anybody in the room that would like to make general public comment, please make sure you've signed up with Athena. If there's anybody in the audience who would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. I am seeing only one hand in the audience, and unless I see more, that's where we're going to keep it. Okay, we have one in the town room and one in the audience. Let me just state that public comment on matters are on matters within the jurisdiction of the town council. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. The first amendment broadly protects individual rights to address the government, to speak and to express themselves, including their right to say hateful and offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those commenters down under the first amendment to the US constitution unless their level of speech falls within an exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual, or incitement of imminent lawless activity. If a question exists as to whether a particular speaker is engaging in unprotected speech, I must defer to the principles of the freedom of speech. We'll recognize the person who is in the town room first. Please come forward, state your name and where you live. Make sure the button is on and it's green. There we go. My name is Andy Anderson. I live in District 40. You need to really move into the mic. My name is Andy Anderson. I live in District 5. I am commenting on the failure of our petition for ranked choice voting to get passed. I'm commenting on the failure of our petition to the legislature to uh, approve our petition for ranked choice voting for use in our uh, town council elections. The uh, joint committee on election laws seemed favorable on this, but at the last minute, everything was sent to study. The word is that the speaker bug footed it, basically. Um, so they came up with some excuses. Excuses were, well, the statewide vote rejected it. You know, we are a state with uh, home rule, so that doesn't apply. We're guaranteed to have the ability to adopt things for our own local governance. They said the there were seven home rule petitions, and each had their own uh, merits they had to study them well we've had ours in there for four years and you know they can study it don't need more time to study it they've had plenty of time to study it they say we had the votes act we have to study its effect well that's not really relevant either because they have different characteristics as to what they do um and finally they say any major changes to voting systems at this time is premature and of course, ranked choice voting is adopt, being adopted all over the country. It's been in Cambridge for 82 years, in East Hampton for three years, I think. Um, so there really is no good reason for them to not move forward on this. Um, but I think the point here is that uh, trying to get it through the legislature is going nowhere. That is not a method by which this can be finally put into place. So you are basically left with three options. One is what I've been suggesting for a while now, which is just you adopt it as a bylaw, put it in place. Um, that was the original intention of the Charter Commission. And um, that would be the uh, simplest way to go. It could be done easily and quickly. 
Uh, you may think that it should be put directly into the charter. There are two ways that this can be done without going through the legislature. Uh, one would be a charter amendment where the council approves things by two thirds, and then it's put before the, the citizens again for a vote. Um, that's sort of what the charter review committee is going to do, but there's no reason to wait because the charter um, you need to conclude. Uh, the RCV Commission has already reviewed this. You could turn around right now and uh, arrange to put it before a vote before the uh, citizens this November, so it could be used the following November. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Um, Georgia Malcolm, please enter the room, state your name and where you live, and make sure you unmute. Thank you. Go ahead, Georgia. Yeah, my name is Georgia Malcolm, and I really, um, you know, this idea that the town council is going to come up <laughs> with some way to um, curb spending, and I just really want to read this to you. This is a, this was shared with Paul Bachman three years ago. It's called the anti race It's a continuum, and I think Amherst falls within here. Tolerant of a limited number of token people of color and members from other social identity groups, allowed in with proper perspective and credentials, may still secretly limit or exclude people of color in contradiction to public policies. Continues to intentionally maintain white power and privilege through its formal policies and practices, teachings, and decision making on all levels of, of institutional life. Often declares we don't have a problem. Um, Monica monocultural norms, policies, and procedures of dominant culture viewed as the right way, business as usual, engages issues of diversity and social justice only on club members' terms and within their comfort zone. You know, so for me, um, you know, I look at Deba Ferreira, who is such um, an amazing human being. And, you know, I remember having a conversation with Paul Buckerman at the high school after a basketball game. And I reminded him that I had met with him before. And I said, when you have a diverse body of people and you have different perspectives, it can be really powerful. And he told me that basically you guys have given him the power and he's not going to share it. And I think you guys have really done a bad job of hold, holding Paul Buckerman accountable. Ms. Anabaku spoke about the ARPA funds that the black businesses didn't get any money. I mean, don't you think that's within the realm of what you guys do to look into? And maybe even yet, maybe first, you know, clean out your own backyard, look at the books, get an auditor, forensic accounting to come in and look at your books before you come and look at our books. Because the reality is that that's been happening for years, previous to Dr. Herman taking over the reins. It's a hard mess. They, she didn't create it. She's inheriting it. And I would appreciate because I don't know. I mean, this policy that you guys are inventing, it really doesn't mean anything. I'm going to be the president of the union come July 1st, and we're not going to be participating in this fiasco of what you guys are trying to introduce. It is really problematic. It is racist. It's discriminatory. And I wish you guys would embrace what you are putting out there instead of trying to be, you know, words. You know, this library, whatever the hell you're talking about. Oh, yeah, make sure it's inclusive. It's, 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 it's hogwash. It's hogwash. And shame on you all. Do the right thing. Enough is enough. Thank you for your comments. Arlie, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Um, hi, my name is... Arlie Gould, I live in South Amherst. Um, just a couple things. Um, I'm finding, and this discussion you had today with the library, I'm finding the whole library, town, private, elected, very confusing because this search for the replacement, and I assume that's for Robert Pam who left, um, in the last meeting, a big deal was made about the trustees are elected. And, um, you know, now is this person going to be elected? I, I, it doesn't 
I'm not, I'm very unclear about the whole thing. I, I thought maybe the trustee should make a video or something explaining very clearly what their dual roles are and how this all works because it is very confusing. And a friend of mine was just asking me, who are the trustees accountable to? And I said, well, I don't think they're accountable to anybody because they're elected. But then now the town council is helping them find a replacement. So if they're so independent and we're not supposed to trespass on their authority, then why is the town council doing this? It's just, it's very confusing and maybe you have explanations for it, but I certainly don't understand it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Arlie. Um, that ends public comment. We're going to move on to the consent agenda. The following items on the consent agenda were chosen because they were assumed to not be controversial. I'll read the motion. If you'd like something removed, please raise your hand. To move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 8E, approval of intergovernmental agreement, public health shared services. 11A to C, approval of the following meeting minutes, March 14. 4, 2024 Special Town Council Meeting, March 13th, 2024 Special Town Council Meeting, March 27th, 2024 Special Town Council Meeting. Councilor Haneke. Um, I don't think we have the March 27th minutes yet. So I would like to remove them from the consent agenda. <laughs> Thank you. If I'm correct. Yeah, it's correct. Thank you for that catch. All right. Are there any other questions? Uh, is there a second? Second, Rooney. Thank you. We're going to move immediately to the vote. We're going to start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier is absent. Um, Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Thank you. We have no resolutions or proclamations tonight. Uh, we are going to move on to discussion item 7B, which is the more war, war memorial pool project update. And I'm going to turn that to our town manager and assistant town manager. And I think David is in the audience. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. That was to tell me the minutes weren't there. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. Paul? So Amy Ruzecki is doing the presentation. She's not here yet. Okay. So then in that case, I think we had told her this would be up at 7.15. So um, but if you want to go to the budget. Uh, yeah. So um, I'm going to start with a motion on the budget and uh, go from there. Having been referred to the Finance Committee on May 6th, 2024, with the Finance Committee having held a public hearing on May 21st, 2024, and submitted a recommendation to the Town Council on June 6, 2024, to adopt Appropriation and Transfer Order FY25 04AA, I'm sorry, an order appropriating the town of Amherst operating budget for fiscal year 2025 as shown on page 12 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second, Ryan. And I'm going to call on Bob Hegner as chair of the Finance Committee to speak to the motion. Well, we, uh, we had a very um, 
long a series of meetings uh, in June to um, review the budget. And um, I will sort of summarize uh, what we found. Uh, first of all, that the, the town manager proposed a balanced budget that adhered to the guidelines set by the council. Um, and it was revised to increase to 4% for municipal schools and the library operating budgets. Um, and the one item we recommended a change as discussed in, in the report is the appropriation for the regional school budget. We uh, recommended an increase to 6% over the 4%. Uh, the things that we noted that were really stressing the budget were labor costs, uh, wages and benefits, which account for most of the operating budgets um, are rising faster than revenues. State funding is failing to keep up with costs. Uh, charter schools cost the town $3 million uh, annually uh, and are a real problem. Um, we added the Crest Department, which is a 10 person new public safety department uh, with full costs in FY24 and F25, FY25. Um, the schools relied on ESSER funds to support operating budgets, and those funds are going to be depleted or going away. And we still believe strongly in or support strongly the 10.5% uh, uh, allocation of property tax to capital because we need the capital improvements. Um, as I said, we recognize that the the regional schools needed additional funding this year. Uh, and as you will see later on, we recommended that the council uh, provide a letter to the regional school committee explaining that we can't support this going forward, that we can only uh, support a 2.5% increase um, going forward and that uh, we can't do it um, with, we, we just can't, um, support this going forward. And, and also that the basis for the FY26 budget should not be the 6% 6 increase, but rather the 4% increase. So that's really kind of a summary of what our discussions were and what we, uh, we wound up supporting and concerning. Thank you, Bob. And I want to just take a moment to thank the the entire finance committee for just their really serious and long and arduous work during the month of um, May ending in June. Uh, and I also want to recognize as we go through this evening that this is the last meeting that the town council will be having Holly Drake and Jennifer LaFountain as the co-finance directors because on July 1, our new finance director begins. And so we wanna also recognize and thank them for their very, very hard work and their true willingness to step into the breach and do an outstanding job for the council and for the town of Amherst. Thank you both Jennifer and Holly. Um, so the floor is open now for questions, comments regarding the operating budget. Pam Rooney. Thank you. I wanted to reinforce what Bob said at the end that they that the finance committee has has stated at least that they do not want the six percent increase in regional high school regional schools um, to become the basis for next year. Is there a way that we make make sure that that is not um, that, that that does not happen. We will get to a letter that's been drafted and placed in our packet. And that point is raised in that letter. And that's where I assume we would probably discuss that some more. Otherwise, um, I think all we can do is send a message. Unless anybody has any other brilliant ideas. Once, they, once we send a message and they give us a proposal, we can send another message. Bob? Well, ultimately, it's what the council uh, decides to, to approve. Uh, so in the end, we the council can decide.
Bob, I think you need to further explain that. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it, basically, the council will decide on the budget for next year, and the budget will in, will include the regional schools. And at some point, the issue of whether or not the budget is two and a half percent, or four percent, or six percent, or eight percent will be will be there, and right. the, the council uh, ultimately can make a decision as to what the council decides they want to support. Right. I'd like to take a moment and make sure that Anna Devlin Gothier can hear us. Hi, everyone. I can hear you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll call on you in a moment. Okay. Oh, I um, just wanted to raise my hand to make sure I could be heard. That's all. Thank you. And welcome, George. I think if if I understand Bob, um, he's just reminding us that we're the ones who vote on the budget. If you want to send a message, you send it by uh, through the budget. Um, the message we're sending here is somewhat confusing, at least what it looks like the message is going to be. We're going to grant a 6% increase when I think many people would say that the message really should be a 4%. Um, we can see what's coming. I assume that the school committee can see what's coming, but I mean, the old adage is when you're in a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging. But what we're doing is we're digging the hole a little bit deeper. Um, so yes, there is a way to send a message and that is through the budget. Okay. Jennifer? Um, so I had a question, I might've, is this where we ask specific questions that were in the budget or in the report? It is. Okay, thank you. Well, first I just so want to thank the- Can I do a point of order? <laughs> yeah. The motion that's on the floor doesn't include any regional spending at all. And so I just want clarification as to whether we're discussing all of the budgets now, despite the motions on the floor, um, all operating budgets or just the operating budgets that are on the floor. Items, the next two motions deal with the regional school budget. So I, I just want clarification. I, I know we have to have the discussion. I just wanna make sure we know when we're supposed to be discussing that part. Thank you. It's this is the operating budget without the school, regional schools in it. Actually, my question wasn't about the regional yeah. schools. Okay. That's why I was asking. All right. <laughs> um, it's a little nitty gritty, but so it for the planning department, it said one of the reasons for some of the budget increases was because the it sounded like the cost of ads had increased. So that's when somebody's applying for a building permit. Is that what that's speaking to? or things where you have to post it publicly in the newspaper. So has is that ever passed on to the applicants? I'm not sure if Holly or, Holly or Jen have the answer to that. So the um, the cost of ads is, uh, I think that we talked about this as finance committee, is that, that it's they're very high. The, um, we can give you a summary of how much they, we've expended in ads. Um, and... Um, so it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So I think there there is a, a charge to the applicant when they apply. But I'm not sure if we recover the full cost of the ads. It can be other things as well, like the council when it publishes um, bylaws and things like that. It, we have to incur the cost of those ads as well. I see Holly and Jen have their hands up, so they probably have better answers than I. Let's go with Holly Drake first. Holly. I was actually going to suggest you start with Jen because I think she knows a little bit more about it than I do. Okay. But yes, we do receive a portion back. Um, and I know that they recently increased it, but it still does not cover the full cost because the, the, the cost of advertising at the Daily Hampshire Gazette has just skyrocketed in the last few years. Jen, sure. do you have more to? Um, nope, that's exactly what I was going to say. Can I build on that and ask, is there any reason we can't charge the full cost? Uh, we can check on that. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Holly, you have your hand up again. Oh, no, sorry. Okay. Jennifer, did you have further questions? I did. I was just going to add, I recall when I was on the local historic district commission that we did once increase that, I don't know if it was just for that commission, but we made the price included in, I guess, when you applied for the building permit to help alleviate some of the cost of posting the public notices that went in the paper. But that's, I, then I had um, oh, a question, just it's more a comment. Um, I, that the sustainability department, yeah, the sustainability department budget, um, well, just I get, my hope would be 
maybe going forward in the next year, we could look at increasing. There's so we have major, large, ambitious goals for sustainability and reaching our climate action goals. But that is a one person department. So I would hope going forward, we could look at making that department more robust in terms of staff and what we appropriate. Okay. Um, Paul, you have your hand. Yes, so thank you for that comment, but this is back on the planning that board adds. So when the money comes in, uh, the money that goes out to pay for the ads comes out of the planning department's budget. The money that comes in goes into the general fund. It doesn't, it's not a revolving fund or anything like that. Okay. Um, are there any more questions on the operating budget excluding the regional school district? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move to a roll call. I'm going to start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Rette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It's unanimous. The next motion is to adopt approval order FY25-01, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District assessment method as shown on page 13 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second, second. Rooney. Okay, the floor is, uh, Bob, would you like to comment on this? Uh, Yes, I mean, we 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 discussed this uh, in great detail and the understanding we received was that if we don't approve the assessment method this year, we'll blow up the budget agreement um, that we have to approve the assessment method. Now we can change our approval as of FY25. Uh, or we can approve a new, we can approve a different uh, assessment um, in FY25, but we had to uh, approve this 6% assessment in order to get the budget through this, this cycle. Okay. Councillor Haneke. I guess I'm going to state it another way. If you don't want a 6% increase and you don't want the town of Amherst to increase that to that 6% from the 4% guidance, you vote no on this motion. <laughs> you know, but there are consequences to that. But this is the motion you would need to vote no to um, because three towns have already approved this assessment method and the budget. Um, the budget, therefore, is in theory approved because it only needs three of the four towns. That's not this motion. That's the next motion on the on the motion sheet. Um, this motion is the assessment method. It needs all four towns to approve it to be in effect. If all four do not, in theory, we default to the statutory asses assessment method, which is not this one. Um, but as Bob said, each year we have to revote this to not default to the statutory. But because the budget has already been approved by three towns, the basically the only the only um, way we have to disagree and reject the budget right now in a way that actually does something is to vote no on this. I'm not arguing to vote no. I actually approved this in the finance committee, but I thought I'd put that out there as more of a clarification since this one's up before the budget vote. George Ryan. Councilor Ryan, I'm sorry. So if we we were to reject this and vote no, um, it reverts to what's called the statutory. That is correct. And my understanding is that then it goes to it goes a budget becomes like a one every month. It's a one twelfth budget <laughs> until a new budget is proposed. Or I mean, explain what blowing up means. I mean, I'm not. I help me understand because I'm I'm not happy with what we're about to do. I understand, I read the report, the report was excellent. It laid out the reasoning. Um, so if, if maybe Mandy or someone could could spell out uh, what ensues if we were to vote no. 
Andy, I'm going to call on you for this one. Yeah, um, I wish we were reversing the order in which we were discussing this and we were taking up the regional budget first so that we have a place to have a healthy discussion of that that doesn't get confusing. This is a confusing question because there are two, I've heard two different views, and I'm still trying to come to grips with why we're hearing two views. Dr. Slaughter has said on several occasions that if um, the assessment method is rejected, that it doesn't necessarily default automatically or right away to um, the statutory method but that it causes the budget to fail because it's integral to the budget. And um, I've never quite understood that because um, it just, um, as I read the statute, I keep getting confused as to where that comes from. And I've not had the opportunity to ask Dr. Slaughter that question. Um, the, um, if it is uh, that it falls to the statutory method, I think that is disadvantage to us because we lose the averaging um, that happens with the current method as agreed to by the four towns where it's not the single year, which can be very unpredictable and can vary a lot but it's actually an average of years that um, is presented in order to buffer the, and that was the agreement that was reached uh, under Sean Mangano's leadership to try and uh, find a method that would not have the unpredictability with it. So this is an extraordinarily complicated question, but I would encourage us to just um, concentrate on the assessment method, which I do recommend, and have the discussion about the regional budget. When we get to the discussion of the regional budget, uh, I don't think we can guarantee that voting no on this would cause the budget to fail. And um, I think there would be consequences for the uh, uh, schools that we need to talk about with the other motion. If it would be more comfortable, we could put this motion aside and go to the next one and then come back to it. You'd need a motion to table? Yes. Yeah, I'd make a motion to table until we have completed the motion on the regional school budget. Is there a second? Second. Who was the second? Jen Tell. Jennifer. Okay. Uh, motion's been made and second. Is there any question? This means we would just come back to this motion after we do the next one. Mindy Jo? Okay. Um, we're going to begin the vote to table this motion with um, Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, an aye. Councilor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councilor Lord? Aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. And Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Okay. We're going to now go on to the next motion. Uh, this motion was not submitted by the Finance Committee. I just want to note that. The motion is as follows. Having been referred to the Finance Committee on May 6, 2024, with the Finance Committee having held a public hearing on May 21, 24, and submitted a recommendation to the Town Council on June 2024 to adopt the revised approval appropriation and transfer order FY25-02, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional FY25 2025 budget and appropriating the town of Amherst share of the budget assessment submitted by the town manager on June 4th, 2024, as shown on page 14 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? 
second. Thank you. Okay, this is the actual 6%. Bob, would you like to speak to this? Well, I think I've already spoken to it. I mean, I think that um, people need to understand, first of all, that the other three towns did vote this 6% uh, increase before we had a chance to, to vote on it. So it was sort of a, um, it was sort of a, a, a fait accompli um, by the time we got to it. Um, you know, we don't, we're not happy with this. We don't like the fact that we're using ARPA funds to, to plug the gap. Um, we don't like the idea that we're violating our own guidelines by using one, you know, um, using uh, a single source of uh, one-time source of funding to, to fill operational uh, needs. But um, the the schools are in crisis right now, and we're trying to patch the the life raft, if you will, um, and keep it keep it afloat for another year. And hopefully, the the school committee is going to uh, look at the budget in a hard way and uh, make some decisions on what needs to, to happen. Uh, we don't have any guarantees of that. Uh, but, you know, we went back and forth on this, and in the end, we decided that it was probably best to just fund the schools with what they need, uh, what they've asked for, and, you know, hope that things are better next year. Kathy? I want to echo what Bob just said. I was strongly in favor of this. I think we have a school system that's been as we all know, without a superintendent, with a finance director doing two jobs and uh, a series of other issues. The new superintendent is coming in with incredible challenges and to be facing her. And this, this allows us to smooth it over, yes, just for one year. So I think it's the smart thing to do. You know, it is, um, and the other thing I wanna say, this is not necessarily of the schools making by themselves. We have two state policies that are sucking resources out of our school system. Over time, they've been hurting community after community, not just Amherst. The first is the way chapter 70 works. If you have declining enrollment, we are losing ground. The state money is paying for a smaller share than it used to of the school budget, of the town's budget. And then the second, which is even larger, is the way the charter school formula works. $3.3 million comes out of our elementary and our regional school budget every year. We send $20,000 per student. So when one student chooses to leave and goes to a charter, we send 20. If they choose to go to a Pelham Elementary School, we send 5,000. So it is just pulling it out and you can see it in the numbers the kids were losing. The charter schools do not take, do they, they don't have the capacity to take severely special need kids that need a high level of staffing to take care of them. So what we're seeing where our enrollment is declining is in the other kids. Um, and so we have two things hitting our school system that are undermining its finances. So I am strongly in favor of at least doing this. We will have to grapple with it. The school committee will and the superintendent will because there's not a quick fix for next year. I mean, we can see what's happening in Northampton, South Hadley, all the towns around us. So this is not a, oh, one could have fixed it along the way. So I think there are some adjustments, but I think we need to do this and I was strongly in favor of keeping the assessment method for the same reason. We can start earlier in the fall to start talking about this with the school system, but right now we need to get the, give them a way to start the year. Councilor Ryan. First, we know that things won't be better next year. It's not, may, may be better, they won't be better. This will make it worse deficit won't be something like a million and a half. And the finance directors looked at the, right at this and it, 
deficit grows over the next couple of years. So we're just making something that's already bad worse. Kathy's right that there are systemic issues here that have been, that make this very difficult. The charter uh, formula, um, the lack of state aid, right? There are a number of things that are outside of our control, but that's been known for some time. That's not a surprise. It's been going on for a long time. It's not like somebody woke up yesterday and thought, oh, state aid's been flat. Oh, the charter schools are really hurting us. We've known this for a long time and we do the best we can with it. And obviously there are hopes that someday this can be addressed, but that's a hope, but we know that. What has been different over the last few years is the use of ESSER funds to support recurrent costs, knowing that was gonna blow a hole in your budget. So it's kind of like the person who, you know, has the life raft and then punches a hole in it and then yells out to you to come and save them. So the ESSER funds, knowingly that was going to lead to a serious problem, which it has. And then the well-deserved salary increases, right? That's great, but anyone paying attention would see that that was going to have serious consequences going forward for the budget. So those are two decisions that have been made over the last few years. Um, and that's a good reason why we're in this position. So um, I understand that this is a bridge, but I don't agree completely that somehow this is a surprise or there was a catastrophe that now we just have to quick make this bridge. Um, a lot of, some of what has happened has been the result of actions that have been taken knowingly over the last few years. And now we're supposed to come to the rescue. Are there any other comments? Seeing none, I'm gonna to move to the vote. And this is the vote for the regional school operating budget. Uh, begin with myself, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Abstain. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin got here. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. It's 12 in favor with one abstention. We're now going to go back to the, the assessment method. I move to remove from the table the motion on uh, the assessment method. I second. The, the motion to table had a until that vote was taken, so I'm not sure that it's necessary, but if you want to make the motion, that's fine. Okay. Um, we're going back to the assessment method. This is to adopt approval order FY25-01 in order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District assessment method as shown on, shown on page 13 of the motion sheet. It's been made and seconded. Uh, Bob, you've already spoken a little bit to this. I'm going to go to Kathy Shane. Uh, yes, I want to speak in favor of this. As um, was stated earlier, three towns have already approved it to not approve it would have a house crashing around our ears, which I don't think we want to have happen. I do think the discussion of the assessment method needs to happen in the poll. This doesn't mean we are forevermore going in that direction. And the letter, the draft letter that's in your packet uh, points to this. We're doing it for this year, but the assessment method next year, 6% is not going to be sustainable. We don't even know whether we'll be able to get to four or three and a half. Um, so this was made clear during our discussion. It is clear in the uh, the document itself and in the letter. So I think this is one where with three towns already stretching themselves to go there, this we need to do or the whole thing what we just passed before doesn't work. This is part of the package. Are there any other comments? And we're going to move to a vote. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Abstain. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. 
Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It's 12 in favor, one abstention. Now we move on to um, the financial order 25-202, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District FY. No, 03A. Oh God, we. I'm sorry, we've already done that. Um, having been referred to the Finance Committee on March on May 6, 2024, with the Finance Committee having held a public hearing on May 21st, 2024, and submitted a recommendation to the Town Council on June 6, 2024, to adopt approval order FY25 03A, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District debt authorization for FY25, as shown on page 15 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Nine seconds. Bob Hagner, did you want to speak to this? Um, this is pretty much, um, it's it's a lot of the uh, the capital improvements were were actually reduced by the the uh, regional schools in order to um, make it. Uh, less onerous uh, on the towns and in order to fit within the budgets. And so um, I think the, I, I can't remember the specific projects now, but I mean, they, they all seem to be reasonable projects that were necessary. Uh, there wasn't any, any project in there that we thought was uh, not, not important enough to fund. Are there any other questions or comments? Pam Rooney. I did have one question on the uh, the high school, B the boundary fence of $20,000. I was assuming that this perhaps would be part of the new track um, project. Why would it be in here as well? Does anybody have a response to that? Councilor Hanneke? I don't know specifically, but it might be a different part of the area. There's a lot of boundary fence <laughs> at, at the high school property, not just on Mattoon Street. And right. so it might be a different fence than the one that borders. I don't know, but that's a possibility. And if it's double spending, we make sure they don't do it. Uh, any other questions or comments? Moving to a vote, Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. It's unanimous. The next is the capital improvement program in the large one. Okay. Point, Having, point of order. I just want to ask about the schedule because I notice it's 715. So are we going to try and finish I think the motion the and budget to before we go back to War plan. Memorial? Okay. Um, um a second point of order before you read that motion. And we had an email come in today that indicated we might have the wrong dates for the public hearing on this motion and the next motion in section B. So I'd just ask our clerk to confirm the public hearing date before you read the motion. I'm waiting to, for Athena to confirm. Um, I want to say we had this hearing on the 3rd of June. 
but I'm trying to find the form. It's possible it was last week. I don't remember. Yeah, it was June 3rd. It, yeah, it is June 3rd. Thank you. Um, so, thank you. So the motion reads as follows. Having been referred to the Finance Committee on May 6th, 2024, with the Finance Committee having held a public hearing on May 21st. June 3rd. On June 3rd. 2024 and submitted a recommendation to the town council on June 6, 2024 to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY 25-05A and order appropriating funds for a portion of the town of Amherst capital program equipment building buildings and facilities as shown on page 16 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, Bob. Um, I, this is actually uh, comes right out of the uh, JCPC um, deliberation. So maybe Kathy can talk about that. Okay, Kathy. Uh, yes, but I also have a question, Bob. So that was a nice punt over to me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when, when we reviewed the um, capital budget, we did have the JCPC report and the Bob and I both served on it, as did um, Anna, and we had to stretch a lot this year because of the staffing vacancies in the finance department. So we got, so we we the budget you saw took Yeoman's effort on a lot of people's part to pull it together. So one of the things um, that we noticed this year, so we have a strong recommendation going forward, is some items appeared on this year's capital budget that weren't on last year's, and they came on as urgent, and they were big ticket items. We have a five-year plan, and it would be good to know if a $2 million project is in the works rather than have it pre presented. So we, we were convinced that it was necessary, but we didn't completely finish our work. Um, so one of the things you'll see is that each year we've been doing a, asking the departments to look at past authorizations and closing out the books that are on, that are more than three years old and they're not spent, asking people if they're gonna spend it. There wasn't time to get that done. So we're looking at a year ago rather than this year. So what we're now, this is the amount of cash that was listed in the JCPC report um, to be authorized. So that's a long explanation of where that money comes from, but you have to look at the capital budget to see what we're spending it on. You know, so the list is the amount here. So Lynn, I do have one question on this, even though I chaired the committee. Okay. So my question is, and it's one of Paul, if, if you look closely at it, you'll see because of the squeeze that we're facing in capital, the road share dropped to $500,000. And so my question is, if we authorize this amount of cash, but we have questions on a few of the items, we never, for example, discussed the Jones IT allocation for 51,000, we just never got to it. So if the library is gonna be closed, it's not clear we need to make that appropriation the urgency of the demolishing of the club down at, at Hickory Ridge, it's not clear we have to do that this year. It looks like the building has to come down. So my question is, Paul, could we revisit a few of these and shift it into roads and still approve the 4.4 million in cash? Because the way the appropriation list is a long list rather than an itemized list. And I don't know how um, to, I guess that's my articulation. So it comes out to be, you know, shift 150, a couple hundred thousand dollars back into roads because we can wait on two of them for next year. So, Paul? yes. So this is the budget that was reviewed and approved by the Joint Capital Planning Committee. It was the com budget that was reviewed and approved by the Finance Committee. Um, Typically what happens is in the fall when we have our free cash certified and we know how much money we have, we try to allocate additional funds for certain projects, specifically 
I understand that roads is a high priority. And if we have additional funds that we've closed out, uh, we, can, we can look into adding more money to roads. Um, the challenge we have, quite frankly, is managing the money that is already in the pipeline. And so recognizing the, the limits of the capacity of our staff to, you know, to spec out, bid out, and then oversee the, the roads projects is, is, a, is a piece of this as well. Um, so typically what happens, and you asked for this to be done earlier, at the end of the fiscal year, the, the uh, comptroller has already started this. Um, she starts to go through all of the capital items, um, see which ones are in progress, sees which ones are not being moved forward, and then closes out the ones that, um, that are not being advanced. And that happens in the, during the course of the summer, and that comes back into the fall when we know how many projects are being, which ones are moving forward, which ones are not. So, um, I guess what I'm hearing you say is you'd like more money into roads. I agree with you. And if we can find more money to put into roads and we can, and we can absorb that into our management plan, we will do that. And Kathy. And just Paul, my other question is with how much flexibility do you have as town managers? So we have the capital plan with a list of projects to say this one, even though it was on the list is not as urgent as shifting some more money to roads. Can you do that or have we locked you in? So these are the projects that we have presented to the council. I'm, uh, you know, I won't just throw a new project on there out of the blue because I think we have a, we have a process that we abide by that in involves all three elected bodies, the, the library trustees, the school committee and the council. Um, and I really honor that process. So, so you won't see me um, add something that you have not reviewed unless because it would require a council to typically appropriate funds in terms of some projects if they if we're not ready to move them forward uh, there are a lot of projects that sometimes don't get moved forward for a variety of reasons um, and so um, sometimes they don't get advanced and some and you'll see them um, the money stays there for a couple of years uh, while we, we're moving things forward so um, I have the ability to not move projects forward if we're not prepared to do them or, or the bids come in too high or whatever. Hope that answers your question. Kathy. So, so thank you. You know, it, it is an odd thing I'm asking because I was chair of the committee that reviewed these, but um, one of the unusual things this year is how late we started. So we all just heaved a sigh of relief to get to the finish line before the report was due, which gave us, you know, so we, you know, in a couple of these, Paul, we didn't say, does it have to be done this year? There was a good reason to do it. And then the end product is this $500,000 on road. So I'm just saying, you know, reviewing some of these on the urgency, maybe it doesn't get done this year or next year. So Lynn, I, I'm not saying to undermine the process. Um, it was it was really a tough project. It was much harder this year than it has been because of the, sta the staffing issues. Um, Thank you. George? So I'm sure Paul won't be surprised uh, that, that I'm gonna express my dismay too at the 500,000 that just went away from road paving. Um, as I believe he knows, I'll be 108 years old when we finally do catch up with the backlog. So I'm kind of hoping that maybe we could think of ways that we could put some money into that. So I just wanna echo what Kathy said. Um, I really do would like an explanation or some kind of story about the 900,000 for public uh, safety radio system. And then it's a million the next year. So it's a 1.9 million expenditure that according to your report was not anticipated last year. So I'd like to understand, I mean, could that be delayed a year or two? Um, is it, and it would seem, since it just suddenly appeared, that it could be. So did you get an explanation or accounting from someone why this has to be done right away uh, and why it wasn't yes, uh, uh, we, told to us before? We did. We actually started to push it off for that reason, George, saying, you know, if it wasn't in the pipeline before, and we discovered that they've been working on it for a couple of years, that the radio frequencies don't talk to each other in the way we want to with other towns and their dead zones. And the equipment, the base equipments are about to not be serviced anymore by the manufacturer. So we split it. The original request was all of it in the one year. And so it was split into two. So um, Sandy Pooler actually had said, let's just move this off to next year. 
and then went back and had a long discussion with uh, the, the fire chief and the police chief. And they said, this is actually pretty urgent that we get this work now. And it's a speak UHF, VHF, I'm not gonna be good on this technical. This allows both to talk to each other and us to talk to other towns on the same frequency. So it's, they're multi-bands. So it, it was, um, startling to have this on the list. And the initial reaction was, where did it come from? And then we found it had been in the work for a couple, couple years. They'd gone out to bids, they had contracts. Could they rent it rather than buy it? What were the lease arrangements? So with, then we got a huge amount of documentation on, on this being something that we needed to move forward. And that convinced us to leave it in. The other thing I just want, one more thing on this is the current uh, appropriation we're looking at is for the cash capital. All of this is borrowing, so it actually doesn't show in cash this year. So it's one of these, we borrow it and it's showing up next year. So it's not, it's not an expenditure line for FY25. It is for FY26, the actual dollars. Um, so that may not uh, say enough, but the documentation that we got after, the, you know, after we first discussed it, and Bob can talk to this, we got this very long document that showed that they looked at different pieces. We asked about just renting it, and the rentals looked like we would end up paying a lot more for the equipment than buying it. So they had gotten some bids on that as well. Yeah, Bob, just, a, you, just, just a point of order. This is actually a separate motion to do the borrowing. Right. So what I was saying, it's not in the, it's not in, I'm sorry to split. That's what I was trying to say, Bob. It's, it's yeah. in the second piece. It's not, it's, it's not drawing on this year's cash. So it's right. not competing with roads. It will compete with roads next year. George, did you have any further? Yeah, I just, again, I appreciate this. I know that this is needed. I understand that they've been working on it, but it does seem to have come struck at least the, the joint, the JCPC with complete surprise. And I'm trying to understand how that could happen. Just a, how could such a, yeah. A point of order, Lynn, this, the public safety radio system is on the next order. It's not on the, Thank it's you. not part of the order that's on the floor right now. That's right. Yes. That's what I was trying Andy, to say. Andy, did you have any comment? Yeah, after with the last comment, I was just wondering if I should wait. But <laughs> um, when we had our various meetings for the operating budget with the very department heads, we did, as um, typically happened, hear a little bit about the capital requests that were coming um, that are related to those departments. And when we were hearing from public safety at the finance committee, uh, we heard from uh, the two of the major departments, uh, police and fire, uh, that very strong statements about why this is urgently needed and their ability to function smoothly and in a coordinated fashion is really dependent upon um, this equipment. So um, I just wanted to add that we heard that at those meetings. Thank you. George, did you have any follow-up question? I still don't think it answers my question, but apparently we're not discussing it now anyway. So we'll discuss it in the next uh, All right. motion. Okay, so we are um, going to move to the vote. This is on transfer order FY25-05A, an order appropriating funds for a portion of the town of Amherst Capital Program equipment, buildings, and facilities. We'll start with Councilor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Abstain. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier is absent. Please note that she left the meeting at um, 7.20. Uh, Councillor Ette. Yes. Lynn Griesmers and I. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. It's 11 in favor, one abstention, one absent. Now we move to the actual borrowing. And I believe the date here is also June 3rd. Is that correct? Okay.
having been referred to the Finance Committee on May 6, 2024, with the Finance Committee having held a public hearing on June 3rd, 2024, and submitted a recommendation to the Town Council on June 6, 2024, to adopt Appropriation and Transfer Order FY25 06A, an order approving and authorizing borrowing to fund capital projects bond authorization as shown on page 17 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Are there any questions or comments? Pam Rooney. Thank you. The way it's written here, it would appear to me that the borrowing is for 1,800,000 and it's all in one borrow, even though we've had several conversations about we would do part A one year and part B another, but it is not clear that that is how it's being voted here. So there's two different parts to the borrowing, the chiller replacement for 900,000 and the public safety radio system for 900,000 as shown on page 17. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Haneke, did you have your hand up? I did. Um, our public safety officials cannot operate if they do not have a functioning radio system. The radio system they have is over 20 years old. It might even be over 30 years old. And they're asking for us to replace it with a new system because the system they have is not, is barely functional. Functional. It doesn't cover the entire town. There are dead areas where they can't actually radio each other. And the system is not really repairable at this time. It's going to be almost unrepairable soon. I'm at a loss to see why this is such a controversial purchase. It's something that our fire department, our police department, potentially even our crest department cannot function without. And we've heard that, yes, it was in the, it's been in the process for a number of years, for some reason, it didn't actually show up on the five-year plan, but it's not like it wasn't thought of for five years. It was already being costed out and all of this. We need this system, and it should not be controversial. Councilor Ryan. So the controversy is not about the need for the system, and the controversy is not about uh, what Councilor Hanneke has just said. The controversy is about why this seems to have come out of the blue. I get the sense reading the report that this was unexpected. Um, it seems like something we have to do and we should do it for the reasons that have been stated. My question was and still is, why was this not, I mean, it thought was being thought about. Um, it, it seems like it wasn't, it wasn't part of the five-year plan. Why wasn't it part of the five-year plan? How can you do a five-year plan if something like this suddenly just comes to you out of the blue? Um, Hickory Ridge issue is, is, is a minor amount and it's, it's a recent development, it's a public health safety, it's a safety hazard, public health hazard, it needs to come down, small amount. But this is you know a huge chunk of money. We've known about it for some time, but apparently the, the capital, the five-year plan didn't know about it. That's my question. It's not about the value of this. Clearly it's important, it has to be done. It's more about the process. Paul? And yeah, I'm sorry. Anything else, George? Paul? No, I think you're right, George, in terms of uh, uh, Councillor Ryan, because it should have been in last year's plan. It wasn't. That's a, um, a a disconnect on our on the staff side. So I think that's a fair statement. It doesn't uh, demean the need for the, the the equipment. I think that that's not what you're saying. You're saying how did how did this process break down? And um, you know, I, I think we recognize that it did. That the, the public safety folks were just not in touch with our finance direct finance folks last year when this should have popped up. And um, my apologies to, to the council for that. It should have. Bob Hagner. Yeah, I, I agree that we, with, with Councilor Ryan, that it shouldn't have happened, but it did. Um, and um, I think we have made it very clear uh, going forward that this, we don't want surprises like this, um, that they're not, they're not acceptable. Um, I don't know what, what else to say. I mean, it, 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 you know, people just screwed up on this one. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a big chunk of money. I agree. But as Councilor Haneke said, this is something that we can't say no to. Um, it, we've got to have, uh, the police and fire have to be able to talk to each other. 
So anyway, it's 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 not a great situation, but um, you know, I think we'll you know we dealt with it the way I think we we needed to, and uh, we hopeful hopefully we've sent a message that this shouldn't happen again. Councilor Ryan, you have further comment? Yes, just for the record. Um, the issue is about the process, not about the need. That's what I was trying to say. I thought I did say, actually. Thank you, Councilor Ryan. Kathy Shane? Yeah, I want to say, okay, to me, looking forward, one of the things I think that we in the JCPC, since I've been on it now for several years, we don't do enough to look at all five years. We focus just on the year. And so one of the things I've noticed is year two, three, four, and five. If I look at last year's two, three, four, and five, uh, George, they don't always match this year's one, two, three, four, <laughs> and it's only a year later. So just trying to think, Paul, it, as the staff thinks about the out years, at least two years in a row, not, not, not necessarily all five. Um, so some things come on this year's third year that weren't even on the horizon last year, but we just didn't have time to talk about those. You know, we were trying to bring home. So I think there's a general process that if it's a five-year plan, we should get the big ticket items on it. And if they disappear, um, that's fine, but there shouldn't be a mismatch. So this is the first time something this big happened. Um, and I think we've just got, there was a, a glitch, um, but hopefully in the future, we will see the FY26 come fairly close to what we thought FY26 was going to be without big surprises. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Um, JCPC always has a challenge. You know, it's been... Can't hear you, Andy. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought I had it in there. Um, you know, JCPC always has a challenge in dealing with five year plan. It's important that we have one. But it's never going to be perfect because there are always going to be um, unexpected items that arise and that they're, they're also going to be um, urgency changes where things which were determined to be urgent um, three or four years from now become more urgent as we get closer in time because of changes in condition. Um, but it is an important part of the process to at least give JCPC the opportunity to look and compare and to ask um, because those questions are there. I just don't want to, um, anybody to expect that what's um, the year four one year is going to look like year three the next year, year two the year after. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, we used to have an additional column, which is kind of beyond, and uh, beyond became so um, cumbersome, and things would stay there forever that it became kind of a, um, a decision to just do away with uh, that additional column because that was uh, uh, really becoming of no use. The other thing is is that. I think the Councilor Ryan is absolutely correct that we have a huge problem with um, roads. And, uh, you know, he talked about projecting into the future and how old he was going to be before we'd get done. And, of course, the reality that I was trying to point out in a conversation recently with him was that actually I'm not convinced we'll ever get done because roads always deteriorate. Um, and unless we happen to move Amherst from its current climate location in the Northeast to a different part of the country where roads don't decay as quickly because of wintertime driving, um, that it is something that we're going to have to face. I think the last thing that I want to point out is that um, town manager said something a few minutes ago, which is that we hope that um, each year, that there will be excess free cash because we're very careful in how we budget so that we project um, each year to try and end up 
with uh, not a deficit and the opposite of a deficit is we get some excess free cash. And uh, I think it's important every year that we look at the free cash as um, a potential for additional road money and um, scrutinize other requests for free cash transfer and make sure that we have the balance right. Uh, but this is not the only time of the year where we should be talking about roads. And I don't think it is the only time of the year that we talk about roads. Motion's been made and seconded. We're going to move to a vote. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Abstain. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? I was absent, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilor Ette? Yes. Lynn Griesmers? Aye. Councilor Haneke? Aye. Count, uh, Bob Hegner? Aye. Councilor Lord? Aye. It's 11 in favor, one abstention, one absent. We're going to move on to the letter to the regional school committee. Point of order? Yes. I'm wondering if we can go back to War Memorial. The letter does not need any staff and War Memorial's discussion that, does. That sounds like a good idea. Why don't we... Um... Okay, Amy, you're here, right? Yes, hi. Um, we're going to go back to item 7B. But also, Amy, you are also here for item 8E, which is the water and sewer rates. So let's make sure we get both done while you're with us, OK? Thank you. So I understand there's a presentation, and we're going to begin with that. Yeah, Let, let me just introduce this. Please. Um, so some years ago, we the town did, had Wes and Sampson do a uh, downtown uh, recreation study. And it, was, it had a very comprehensive uh, analysis of our, the recreational needs downtown. Um, and we've been sort of picking through the things as they come up. The thing that has um, arisen most recently has been, and it's, you know, not like this week or anything, has been the War Memorial Pool and the bathhouse that's associated with it. And so we started doing some work into what that would take, what it would take to uh, rehab the War Memorial Pool bathhouse. And then as you, we look at this um, comprehensively, we say, well, what are, what are the improvements we'd like to make to that entire area? So that's the work that we have done. And um, I can come back to later, but maybe the first thing is for uh, Amy to give you a, a glimpse of it. What we've, what, and just a spoiler alert, the number is really big. And so that has given us pause in terms of what we can really afford is in the time and what, what the timing would be. So there's no request to the council tonight. This is purely informational for your, for your benefit. Amy. Amy. All right. Well, Paul did half of that. So now I'm going to, it's all good. We're going to be jumping everywhere now. Uh, so yeah, so I just wanted to, this is more just kind of an update for informational purposes for you guys. Um, so I'm sorry to kind of shoehorn it in on a night when I know you guys are very busy with a lot of other important topics, um, but thought it was important that you guys understand what's going on. So um, Athena, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, as Paul said, um, this project, we kind of have the short-term goal and then the long-term goal. Um, the long-term goal is we do want to look ultimately at revitalization of that entire area. Anybody that's been to the playground, been to this uh, basketball court has seen that um, it, it, it could use a facelift. You know, it could use a little more attention and it's got a lot of outdated equipment. Uh, but the more immediate need is the bathhouse. Um, but because of that, as we approached this project, we didn't just look at, hey, let's replace the bathhouse in kind. We said, okay, what are the additional uses and how can we think about the bathhouse in a way that takes into consideration what the future vision of this area is? Um, and I threw in a quote from that uh, 2019 facility strategic plan that Paul was referring to, to, which just said the pool house building is beyond its useful life. Um, Quickest way I could ever tell you the conditions of where we're at. Um, but Athena, if you can go to the next slide. Um, some of these, I just have a couple of photos that show truly the conditions of the bathhouse. Um, our guys on an annual basis do everything they can to patch this up and get this open. Uh, but we struggle each year to continue to pass the inspection to be able to open the bathhouse. 
Um, so you're seeing, you know, on the left hand side, there's some, you know, a bunch of rusted up pipes and you can see the condition of the floor there. Um, you know, even though they paint over it, the condition of the floor is in really rough shape. Um, and on the right hand side, um, again, there's some CMU block that is pulling away from each other. So it's causing some cracks. And there's also a lot of, um, again, rust on, on the pipes. Um, if you can go to the next one, Athena. Um, you know, we've got some separation in the wall on the left hand side. And again, some um, splitting. If you look carefully, there's some U CMU wall, um, CMU blocks that are also splitting over there. Um, we've got some cracks where the, um, uh, between the foundation and the bottom of the, the blocks that it's starting to kind of erode up, which makes it big enough for um, rodents of all sizes to be able to get into the pool house and uh, do their damage inside. Um, and this kind of, if you've ever walked around the pool house and just looked, um, you can see splitting like that um, almost the entire way around the building. Um, and I think at the end of there's one more picture like that. Yeah. Um, so the last one is just showing again, the, um, you know, a pipe with a bunch of rust on it. Um, and I guess this photo in the, um, the scope that you guys are looking at it, you can't quite see it, but if you look at the roof of the building, um, there's several places where there's shingles missing as well. Um, so some of these are just quick snapshots. Um, but you know, again, it's, it's not putting our best foot forward for sure. Um, as somebody comes to the pool and then they're going through, um, a pool house that has, you know, splitting CMU blocks and has, uh, you know, rusted pipes and ha you know, um, has a floor that just is showing its age. So, um, if you can go to the next slide, Athena. So just kind of a brief history on this. Um, the War Memorial Pool and Bathhouse was constructed in 1953. So at this point, we're looking at, you know, what is that, a 70-year-old building? Um, you know, it's it's had a good, long, hearty life. Um, and then as far as we can tell in terms of upgrades to this facility, we know that there was a filter system replacement at some point. We're not sure. Uh, but we know in 2012, um, we had um, uh, CPA funding um, approved um, some improvements, or they funded some improvements, um, and that included a new filtration system and a PVC liner. And there also was a pool deck replacement, including a lot of accessibility improvements, um, but it didn't really touch the building. And so the building is really kind of 70 years old. And other than uh, the paint jobs and um, spot improvements here and there, it's it's essentially a 70 year old structure. Um, uh, Paul talked about the 2019 facility strategic plan, which recommended reconfiguration and enhancements to the community field area in general, uh, which includes the War Memorial area. Um, what you're seeing on the left hand side of this slide is the we call it the 10,000 foot view of this area. So kind of what they envisioned, um, which included, you know, the pool and a, a pool house, a splash pad, uh, playground areas, um, and, and a bunch of other ways to just really kind of um, revitalize that area and bring, bring more people to that area. Um, and so 2024 CPA funds uh, were allocated for us to start this preliminary design which includes that schematic design of the entire area so that it could inform what we want for the uh, bathhouse design. So that's kind of our brief history. Um, Athena, if you can go to the next slide. So um, this is what our consultants have come up with thus far in terms of the, um, the schematic design of the area as they're moving forward with um, design on the bathhouse. And so what they're looking at is um, a new bathhouse, which is uh, relocated uh, to the east side of the pool. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at with this is trying to, right now the bathhouse serves just the pool needs. So it's open for two months a year. So it means it's, you know, this is, this is an expensive pro uh, project, as Paul says, but it's a project that, um, if, if we were simply to re replace the bathhouse in kind, um, you're looking at a facility that is used for two months out of the year. So we're looking at ways to make it um, a little more worth the value of what we're getting. So we are looking at one uh, bathhouse that's 
an eight month operation. So it can be used for the pool operations during those two months. And then when the pool is closed, it can be used um, as restroom facilities. Um, basically, it's not gonna be a heated space. So basically the entire season that um, we're not freezing outside. And so that would mean for users of the track, this would be the nearest rest, you know, public restroom facility. Um, if at some point we get this whole playground area, it would be uh, for that as well, um, as well as, you know, the people that are up on like, say the softball field, this would be the nearest um, restroom facility for them to use. Um, and one of the things that we are looking at is having a community room on the bathhouse. Um, and again, that there's a lot of pluses to that of, you know, being able to have a space that you could have camps, you could have meetings, um, it could, you know, potentially generate a little bit of revenue with, um, you know, renting it for, say, parties and stuff like that. Um, the, the, the cost of that isn't, it's pretty incremental when you look at the whole thing. But again, we understand that that's, that's an item we may have to compromise on. Um, the, the preliminary design also is fully ADA accessible. So it's looking at bringing the entire site up to the current ADA accessible um, guidelines. Um, there's the splash pad area as a future build out um, and also the upgraded area for play and picnic. Um, that's kind of in the phase two, if you are, uh, if you will, of the area. Um, and, and the consultants have been pretty innovative as they've been designing stuff. So they've been looking at um, ways to integrate that slope. There's a, there's a berm there that basically separates the softball field above to that war memorial area. So they're looking at ways to incorporate um, the slope, whether it's um, an embankment slide or other play elements on the slope um, or using it for like a small amphitheater area. So um and then they also were looking at um, uses of the stormwater, which um, this site needs a lot of kind of stormwater control. And so they were looking at ways of kind of incorporating that into some of the play elements. Um, so we think um, generally the, the consultant has been pretty creative in finding, finding these little ways to um, really be innovative. If you can go to the next slide. Um, this just kind of shows quickly the the phasing because ev everyone that looks at that design, they get really drawn in by the playground and the all the fun elements. Um, and I, I do want to be clear that um, the more immediate need is the bathhouse. And so, you know, just replacing the bathhouse and doing the site improvements that are needed around the bathhouse area, that's the phase one that's a little more immediate. Um, and the phase two, so the uh, the more fun, <laughs> the more fun elements um, at this point are the future vision that we need to keep in mind, but aren't necessarily um, what's driving this forward. Um, and I do I do want to be clear as as I'm saying this that you know you can't open a pool without a facility for a bather or for swimmers to change and to shower ahead of time, and so. The having a bathhouse here um, is what's allowing us to continue to operate War Memorial Pool. And so um, that, that's part of the, the driving force here is if, um, if this pool house falls in disrepair and we can't open it one year, then it means this entire pool facility is offline until we can find a solution. Um, next slide. Um, so as Paul said, it's a big number, um, right now for the phase one, the final design and construction of it, um, they're estimating, uh, right now they're estimating it's on the order of $4 million. Um, we got CPA funding, hopefully if you guys voted it, um, for FY25, um, for three quarters of a million. And the intent of that was to have, um, matching portions of um, town matching funds for if we were looking at grants. Um, based on the timing of where we're at, we are looking at uh, 2025 as the earliest option to apply for grant funding. Um, and there's half a million to 1 million in potential grant funding uh, based on what program we go after and if we're successful. Um, and then, you know, I do want to put it out there that we're, we're likely going to be coming back to CPA this year, um, 
for another um, funding request. Um, you know, at some point we're going to have to figure out how we can bridge bridge the gap between what we have now, even with some grant funding, and what the cost will be. So, I think that's it. I think my last slide just says questions, um, but you can see a lot of the um, playground equipment that I'm sure was really innovative in 1950s when it was placed. But um, yeah, I, unless Paul has anything else to add, that's that's all I wanted to update you guys on. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, it, it's a great vision for this area. Given this, the numbers that we just that we've looked at, we're not prepared to move forward our, on a, the park grant, which would be the major grant for this this year. Uh, we just need to do more sort of financial planning for this project and how it fits into our overall plan. The number was much higher than we had anticipated. So uh, we're going to continue to. Um, look into how, you know, I think we've got the basis for a good plan. We have a phased process, which is really good, um, but the financing is, has to be worked on more uh, in more detail. Um, the, in, there's, a, you know, there's also a conversation whether the town really wants to have two outdoor swimming pools. That's something that's important for the, the conversation for us to have, because if we are, then we have to make this investment. Um, Mill River is a much higher, and we don't, I don't want to get into that to, to discussion now, except to say, why is this pool important? This is where all of our camps that we use during the summer, that we have during the summer, that's where all the kids go swimming from the camps. They could use Mill River, but it requires transportation up and back. So that's the good thing about this pool. There's some members of the community that also use it. So, uh, but I think this leads to a larger discussion about our investment in recreational facilities, uh, especially such a large investment as this. Councilor Haneke. So thank you, Amy, and thank you, Lynn, for putting this on the agenda. Um, a couple of comments. I think we need to put, just like we did for the Fort River school replacement and Wildwood school replacement, where we said to the architects and designers, no more than a hundred million. Um, and they came in under that. And it's, I think one, you know, that's a big number, right? But but they came in under that. And as we saw with Jabish Brook down in Belchertown, um, when you don't, think about costs, you lose completely. We can do this um, for a hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think 4 million is too much. We need to be looking lower. Um, and we need to tell them it needs, I think we have to come in with another number and tell them, find a way to come on under something, another number. Um, I was going to bring up, do we even need another pool? Um, if we have a pool, do we need a splash pad there? And I know phase one doesn't include the other parts, but I am concerned that the newest drawings get rid of all of the teen and adult use in favor of more children use. Um, the kids have a park two blocks away to play in. The teens have nothing. The adults don't have something. There's plenty of outdoor rec stuff for adults and for teens, and we need a space for it. And this is what I was hoping this space would be. And now in the 10,000 foot view, it's completely gone again. Um, that really concerns me because the teens, given that this is right by the high school, the teens need it. Um, the adults could use it that way too. You know, if you put in one of those exercise things and all, and I know there was an exercise circuit way over by DPW, we're still waiting, we're in summer and we're still waiting on your thoughts on DPW. That could be another decade or more. We need teen space now. Um, as to the bathhouse, the design I saw that you guys have pulled because it was really expensive and didn't even show those um, seemed to indicate that the bathrooms, if it was summer, would be available for pool users only because you'd have to go through the pool to use it and you'd have to pay your pool entrance. And then outside of the pool hours, maybe you could close the pool off and then have them available for that. I think in the summer, those bathrooms need available for both sets of users, whether that means we have to have kind of two sets of bathrooms with a gate in between so that you don't have to pay to get in to use the bathrooms. I don't know, but eight months a year, they need to be accessible for people not using the pool if we keep a pool there. Um, they can't not be accessible in the summer months to those not using the pool. Um, so I think that needs to be in there. And at this point, that's 
what I, oh, the other thing I had was the basketball courts. Again, I know there's a full plan. That's on like phase three. I don't know how long phase three is, um, but moving this bathhouse to where it goes, which makes a lot of sense, would remove the basketball courts that even in this rough condition are played on by the kids, by the teens. And I'm really concerned about doing the bathhouse and removing teen space where they actually use it near the high school. And so maybe we need to find basketball courts somewhere in this plan in phase one or quick phase two and rethink the part in front of DPW or something. Kathy Shane. But uh, I'll try to build on Mandy's, um, both just so everyone knows, we asked to have this presentation as early as possible. So Amy and everyone could get comments from us. Um, Ma, I'll focus on the bathhouse because most of what she said, I would, I totally agree with, you know, we don't need necessarily another splash area for little kids. We've got a different one down the street. And when the original master plan was done, Paul, there wasn't a Kendrick Park, you know, and there wasn't what we're doing over at Fort River, you know, so some things have changed in terms of outdoor space. So my question is, what if we just do a simple bathhouse? Because I saw the larger presentation you did for the community and listening. It, it looks like a country club bathhouse, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, but with the community room and everything else, but a bathhouse that has the necessary bathrooms, the shower, the sink, but keeping it small. And the way Mill River right now works, you can get into bathrooms from an outside door. Mandy, you don't have to go all the way in. So the people who play tennis and go in the park, the bathrooms fortunately start to open a little bit before the pool opens, but there are bathrooms. But if you need a bathroom in November, forget it. Um, you know, just, you know, go home. Um, so, but I think thinking of what if we just replace the bathhouse in its simplest form, um, having at least one option that looks at, like that as an alternative that's not as beautiful. And I understand community room, but we're also building, if, if, if the library goes through, suddenly there's a huge amount of community space in the library. Um, and we, get back the glass room where the war, uh, Civil War tablets are in banks. So I'm not sure we need that space either. It's, they're always nice. So, so I just thinking paring down Mandy's idea of a tighter budget and still getting us the, the bare necessities. Her first question was the big one that Paul writes, is do we need two pools? Um, because we're, we need to do a bathhouse if we need this pool. So I'm not prepared to speak to that, but we were looking at the user numbers for the pool and they're not as high as one might think. So Paul, I understand it's the summer comes. So if we're gonna keep the two pools, I would go for a smaller vision of what a bathhouse needs to be. A good one, but not the one we just saw. I don't, I'm not sure that's salvageable. Thank you. Alicia, I'm gonna come back to you, but Guilford, you have your hand up. Yes, I just want to clarify a couple of things. There, are, there is access to the bathrooms from the outside, just like at Mill River. So that is there. Um, you do have the most pared down facility we could design. You, we can take out the, the uh, meeting room, and that saves a very small amount of money. Um, the bathrooms are actually when the pool is closed, you can also use the locker room. So if you have a sporting event and somebody on the up on the field needs a, a place to change, you have the outside sporting, you have an outside locker room access. We made it as simple as can possibly can be. Um, it's kind of phased or it's kind of based on the facility they just built in Buckland. If you want to go look at the Buckland facility, they built that one. They designed that one and that one was built. It's very, this, this is very low key, low frill. If you want bathrooms that are open 12 months a year, you're going to have to put heat in. Um, none of our outdoor facilities have heated bathrooms since they all close down when winter comes. So those are just things to think about, but we, 
we have kind of much made as much as small as you can. The prices right now are just astronomical. Um, the only other thing to do would to be build something like a you would see at a beach facility, which are to is totally open to the elements, and you go behind a, a screen, you change the bathrooms behind a screen. It may have a ceiling on top of it. Um, you have you have a very simple thing. The question really is, do you want to have two pools and two bath facilities? Maybe we just have one pool and get rid of the second pool. Sorry, I just had to clarify a couple of things and I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Walker, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Lynn. Um, so I don't disagree with anything that Mandy, Joe, or Kathy said, but I did also want to just add a few things as to what my experience has been utilizing these facilities, especially this year. Um, and so I know like the, everything just recently opened, but for example, um, for the question, do we need two pools? I would say yes, very much so. For example, this past weekend, Mill River Pool was at capacity for five hours. They were not letting anybody else use the pool and the park was full of kids waiting to use the pool. Um, so I do think, you know, we had a high number of people using the pool because it was free um, because of the heat wave. But I do think that it just shows that there's a huge, you know, there's a huge demand for for uh, youth to have that kind of space in this area and the the people in this town are really using the pools uh, we've already seen it um it's been hard for my kids and I to get space at even the splash pad at Groff Park which has also been we have seen a huge increase in the last couple of years of people coming from out of town to be at the splash park I think we went to my kids had two birthday parties there the, the last weekend, and there was like seven different birthday parties happening at the Splash Park at the same time. It was completely full. People were having parties on the side where people don't even usually have parties. Um, and so, yes, um, there is an increased demand for the use of our facilities, and I think more space for our residents and more pools um, would be definitely used. I think we would utilize them. And I also think that being said that we would use utilize another splash park. Um, the one that we have is really very much being used. Um, and I do know that we do have the Kendrick park around the corner and I do think it's great. But for me as a parent with kids of all different ages, I think that is something that I struggle with in this town is that, you know, when I'm, my littles want to go to Kendrick park, my older son is like, why are we here? There's nothing for me to do. Um, and so War Memorial, e even though it's run down, has been a good place, kind of like Mill River, because it has the basketball courts, it has the pool, it's close to the football field. And so it becomes a space where like multi-generational families can use. Um, and so I would love to see, like, I think Mandy Joe said, more stuff for teens to stay. Not that I'm opposed to a splash park or a park or anything like that, but we need the basketball court. Um, at War Memorial, I know my sons both use that basketball court, even when we're leaving basketball practice, which is at the high school, they're going outside to the basketball court to play more basketball. Um, and so I think it would be a huge loss for the community to have those things. Um, I'm also in agreement with, you know, just, I don't think we need an additional community room in the bathhouse. I think just small and simple and updated would be beneficial. Um, but I am really excited to see that we're starting to plan this and we're moving forward with this. Um, I think it will be really uh, useful, beneficial space for our community. So thank you. Thank you, Alicia. And I'm just gonna say ditto to what Alicia said. We, we don't have families with just only teenagers. We have families with teenagers and young kids. And you know the parents aren't gonna be able to have the kids over at one park and the other kids over at this park. This is a multi-generational place. And um, it does seem to me that based on the numbers and the ongoing rising heat that we are all experiencing as early as June this year, that giving up two pools at a time when we're dealing with that is not the time to think about giving up two pools. Thank you. Jennifer? Uh, yes. Yeah, so as Kendrick Park doesn't have a splash pad. Um, no. Right. So it would be nice. I would also say Kendrick Park has brought a lot of people downtown and to the extent to which the War Memorial is near, the pool is near downtown, I think that if that is a greater magnet to pe bring people to the center of town and solicit, you know, patronize businesses downtown, 
I, I think it would be a great investment for that reason, in addition to everything uh, Lynn and Kathy and Mandy just said. Thank you. Amy and David, you both have your hands up. Amy? Yeah, and I, I more just wanted to add, especially you guys expressed um, wanting to have space for teen use and, you know, not just young kid playground. And I do want to be clear, we didn't get into kind of what the 10,000 foot look or the conceptual design was, but it doesn't act, it does include teen space. And that was a big conversation, especially with the proximity to the high school. So I do want to reassure you guys that that is um, still part of the conversation and something that the, you know, everyone involved has recognized is important for this facility, not just catering to the kids. David? Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Yeah, just to build on what Amy said, um, this is this is still a high, high uh, elevation look at the space around the pool. Amy's focus was on the pool house itself. Um, we certainly want to keep our you know, options open for other opportunities for, for instance, sport court. I think some of you have heard about sport courts, which are these basically kind of plug and play exercise areas where you can stretch, you can lift, you can do yoga, things like that. Angela Mills in the town manager's office and I have been working on that for a little while. But I also want to point out that we can't do everything, say, for teens or or a certain age group in that small space. This is community field and the high school and a regional high school. So hopefully we're gonna have a brand new track and field and walking paths around it. Someday we'll have a new softball field, you know, in time, but there are lots of things to do there. We just can't do everything in that small space. The other thing I think we need to do, and Amy has done some of this outreach and, and we'll have some more time now that we're we're, we're say going for a park grant in 25 is we need to hear more from the community. It's it's not clear to us when people say there should be more things for teens to do. It's not exactly clear what that what that is. I'll give you an example. I'm being asked by parents to look at something for young people uh, of all ages, um, and that is a a pump track for young people who want to get into uh, mountain biking. So it's a wonderful thing. They have them in many communities throughout, throughout the region. But anyway, a pump track probably isn't, isn't compatible there, but we need to know from the community, we've gotten very little impact from, or excuse me, input from the schools. What is it, what are the needs of young people, and I'll leave that undefined, for this kind of outdoor space? What would serve um, a, a broader range of young people in that space. So I'm just putting it out there. We'd like to know, and of course, Amy and the design team is open to those that kind of input. So we'll have a little more time to get that input over the next year, year and a half. Alicia. Um, thank you, Dave. I think that's a really important point. And I have some like thoughts, but I'm not a teenager. Um, and so I think that this is an, this is like a really good opportunity for community engagement with youth and like just directly asking middle school and high school, high school students what they would want to see there. And I'm hoping like maybe a partnership with the schools to get that information would be helpful because I would love to be able to see the town putting things there that are specifically asked for by the youth and not that parents don't also know, but I think youth know what they need a little bit, you know, they know what they want to see there. And I would love to hear it from them directly opposed to like myself or other. Jennifer. Um, I totally agree with what uh, Councilor Walker just said, but I did want to, clarify, we, I recall that Pam and I put a link <clears throat> in one of our newsletters that there is a questionnaire or survey out now from the recreation department. I can't recall exactly what it was. Space. Open space. Yeah. I don't know if that was trying to get to what people want in recreation opportunities. We are working, we're working on an update to the open space and recreation plan. It's not specific to this area or what young people want in our community, but I agree with Councillor Walker that we need to hear from young people and not what we as adults, do we want a skate park? We spent a lot of time and many years 
talking about, do we want a skate park in this town? Ultimately, for funding reasons and other reasons, I think we moved away from that. And now I think young people would say, eh, don't build a skate park because we'll just go to UMass and use all that concrete and skate up there. But we need to hear from young people. What do they want? And then we can design something um, that they would like in that space and, and in the adjacent spaces. Paul Bachman, please. Yeah, so just to sum up, um, thank you for the comments. They're valuable comments. Uh, when we did a listening session, it was on the night of a council meeting, so we recognized that that was poorly timed. And you know, and we heard from a limited number of the public. We do need to reach out. I appreciate uh, Councillor Walker's comment about reaching out to the youth directly. Um, this is raising up on the radar because um, we're anticipating that building to be, you know, every year we cross our fingers and hope that it passes inspection that we can use and open the pool. So that's the um, urgency of this. Um, we are not going for the park grant this year because we don't think that we're prepared to have a, a, a um, super strong uh, presentation as well. So we, we can put that off for a year, but this will give us a year to do additional outreach and planning. So thank you for your comments. Is there any other comments or questions on this particular item? We're going to take a break, but not yet, because I want to get to water and sewer rates, which is actually item 8E. Um, and it's because Amy and Guilford are here, and then we're done with having to have them here. So it's 8D. I said E, but it's D. E. It's D. Oh, yes, you are right. So I'm sorry if something screwed up on my thing. 8D, water and sewer rates. Um, Guilford or Amy, do you want to, Amy, I think you're presenting on this, right? Um, Lynn, the only reason this is on the agenda again tonight is because in order to uh, vote the water and sewer rates, the council needs to amend the water and sewer regulations. So we're doing a first read of the change to the water and sewer regulations and we're asking the council to merely amend the regulations to increase the water and sewer rates. So this is a first reading of those regulation changes. We already had the water and sewer rates recommended by finance committee and um, presented to the council previously. So you've had a memo yep. and, the, and the draft changes to the uh, regulations are in your packet. Thank you. Um, and does the finance committee have any comment on this? No, we just, we did approve. Um, we, we were con one concern we had um, was that uh, water consumption has gone down along with revenues. And uh, we asked the superintendent about um, the status of looking into different metering, uh, different uh, pricing for meters so that we would, you know, you'd have a, a sort of a fixed price uh irrespective of how much you actually use and then a variable price based on what you use and um the the response was that um now that the um the uh department has the basically owns the um the water meters they can replace them at at their convenience and when they need it and uh, both umass and amherst college maybe were under metered uh, we're using more than than what what they were being charged for. So um, that's kind of where that went to. Um, and then we also asked whether the increases in water and sewer rates uh, were sufficient to cover replacement of the aging infrastructure. And uh, the answer that we got was that it, it appears that the water system is fine the sewer system may need more replacement than we will have funding for given the rates that we have. So that's something that we don't know. It's gonna be a future issue, but it's something to keep our, keep our eye on. But other than that, we, we approved, we thought the rates were reasonable and we approved them and they are lower than, than the other jurisdictions near us. Well. I'm just reminded that you're all invited to tour the wastewater treatment facility tomorrow at eight, uh, Wednesday at 11, and then July 10th, I think is at 10. So if you just let Angela know which one you're going to go up, show up. Um, so we'll, and it's, and um, if you can bring, ear, if you have um, earplugs because it's loud, if you not, if you don't have them, they'll have the, some for you there. Okay. 
Are there any other questions on the water and sewer regulations? And the only reason we have to go into the regulations is because that's where the rates are. Mm -hmm. This was the first read. Andy. Yeah, just a question as to whether we could amend the, the regulations here so that they automatically link to the recently voted rates as approved by acting as water and commissioners and don't have to go through this two-step process. Athena? I think Amy can speak to that. Amy? In terms of how the regulations were written with the water and sewer rates in the appendix. Amy? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> You're saying, do you want to take that one, Guilford? <laughs> I can take that one. Thank you. So, so, so when we proposed the water and sewer regulations, we were told the rates needed to be inside the regulations, and that's why they're there. Um, if our attorney wishes to look at it again and comes back and says it can be a separate one, we'd be happy to have it separate. But when we were putting it together, our attorney rec attorneys recommended we be they be inside the regulations. So for this year, that's how we're going to do it, and we'll see if there's any way to look at it in the future. This will come back for a second reading on July 15th, and we have already checked and made sure that that does not hinder the billing process as of July 1. Are there any other comments on this? A point of order, Lynn, you said the billing process on July 1, but the, the new rates will be effective after the council votes on the 15th, so the new rates will go into effect on the 16th, and bills will be sent out as of that date. They won't be retroactive. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. We will reconvene, I'm sorry, a nine minute break. We're gonna reconvene at 8.35, at which point we will take up item C. Thank you, Guilford and Amy. Thank you. Please turn off your video and your mic.
please return to your seats so that we can reconvene and turn your videos back on. We're going to reconvene in one minute. Okay, the next topic on our agenda is the letter that has been drafted by the Finance Committee um, to the Regional School Committee. It is in your packet, and um, I'm going to call on Bob Hegner to introduce this, and then we'll take suggestions. Bob? So, um, following up on our conversation earlier, um, we want we drafted this letter in order to explain our position to the regional um, school committee about how we're concerned about not going to 6%, but staying within um, a increase that's sustainable over time. Um, it's This is a letter that's very difficult to write because we don't want to um, come across as usurping the authority of the school committee. Um, we, we, don't, we don't wanna be confrontational with them, but we need to lay out very clearly what the town can and cannot do fiscally in terms of you know, sustainability over time. So that's what we've tried to do in this letter. Um, I think we've done a pretty good job. Um, mostly it was uh, Kathy and Councilor Haneke who drafted this. Um, so um, we, we, um, we, we tried to, you know, kind of thread the needle on, you know, making it very clear what our position was, but not, you know, sort of saying to the regional school committee, we know better than you do. So um, anyway, it, it is what it is. So um, I don't know, either uh, Thank Council you. Kennedy or if Kathy, do you want to add anything? Okay. I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, Councilor Ryan. Point of order. Do you want to begin with the motion? Ah, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, to authorize the town council president to send a letter recommended by finance committee regarding the Amherst Pelham Regional School District FY25 budget and FY26 budget process to the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee as presented. And we'll see if that Second. changes. Second. Thank you. Now, George. So yes, I'm appreciative very much of the work that went into this. I think it's an excellent letter um, and I think it's the right thing to do. And I appreciate Bob's comment that it's it's a matter of trying to find the right um, line. We're not trying to dictate, but we have a real concern. And I think this conveys that very well and it provides a fair amount of detail and data, which I appreciate as well. Um, so thank you, especially the two counselors who, who work so hard on this. I think it's great. I had one uh, small sort of suggestion, or at least a, a, a comment. Um, I'm not sure how, is this the second page or is, there, is it numbered? <laughs> it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight paragraph. It's paragraph just above the, uh, uh, the data chart. Um, it, the sentence reads, staffing has fluctuated over the past 25 years while student enrollment has decreased over 25%. Um, in fact, uh, student enrollment has decreased uh, in those 25 years by almost over 40%. Um, the chart shows that it's decreased over the last 14 years um, by uh, 27%. So I would suggest that we make that 40% rather than 25%, um, if you're talking about 25 years. And it, again, reinforces um, the, the fact that, that people need to confront, which is we've seen an extraordinary decline in enrollment. Um, so unless my math is wrong, and unless I'm reading that sentence wrong, which is referring to a 25-year period, um, that number actually should be 40%. Lynn? 
Councillor Haneke. That would be a typo on my part. It was supposed to refer to a 15 year period. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hit a two instead of a one when I was typing yeah, we, the past. So it should be the past 15 so years. Sister, yeah, we only, we only really present data for 15 years, so we shouldn't go past what Yeah, we, it was meant to say 15, not 25. Right, so it's 15 years and 25%. In fact, if, if you go beyond 15 years to 25 years, it is 40%. But this chart is 15 years, okay? Uh, we've addressed that one. Is there any other questions or comments? Councillor George, Councillor Ryan, did you have anything else? Uh, okay, Councillor Walker. Um, I was hoping that Mandy, Joe, and Kathy can remind me what the goal of this letter was. Like, I know we're sending it to the school committee, and what do we hope the result will be? Um, because I I do have a following question, but I think that that would be helpful helpful for me first. Okay, Mandy, Joe, Kathy. Uh as as the finance chair indicated, the, the goal came from all of the finance committee's discussions surrounding the request to increase the regional school's assessment above council guidelines um, and all of the concerns that the finance committee had um, with that request, but also with actually recommending such an increase and how the Finance Committee recommended that increase by the use of also one-time funds and how all of that goes there. And to be able to recognize that the financial orders on their own don't transmit any of those concerns. They just are just orders that say you have this money. Um, and so we felt a letter transmitting the concerns that summarized our sort of that came out during those discussions about the fact that we're actually funding that additional increase above our own guidelines with one-time money um, that isn't there next year ourselves. Um, and so we can't really start our next year's increase on that number because, well, it's not in the budget really this year. Um, and the recognition that the the situation we see ourselves in and the school committee sees themselves in um, needs resolved um, and it needs a serious look in terms of the structural issues that came out at the four towns meeting. And so it was trying to bring all that in and and say, we are here to support you, but we also have major concerns and our, our funding and our passage of the budget for FY25 um, does not alleviate any of those concerns. Councilor Walker. Um, thank you, Mandy Joe. So sorry, I am on the finance committee. So I was a part of all of those discussions, but I <laughs> felt like I didn't, like I get that these are expressing our concerns which I was in favor of sending communication to the regional school committee because I believe it's extremely important, especially under these circumstances for us to have you know, ongoing communication and dialogue about what is going to happen for the future, how we can best support them um, within bounds. Um, but I'm not sure that I got the message I thought I was going to get when I read this. Um, like it didn't feel as though we were being supportive or as though we were asking for something specific. I feel like it's just saying we are doing this now and we're not going to do it again and you better figure it out kind of thing. Um, partially like this exact section that I think George was just referencing um, in regards to expenditures on uh, special education and how that relates to student enrollment. I wasn't even sure why that that was necessary be included. Okay. You want me to respond? Um, either Mandy, Joe, or yeah, so, go ahead. Okay. So either one. So it was included because during those conversations, um, at least one finance committee member said it was important to include that information in such a letter um, because it was part of our concerns about the unsustainability of the budget. Okay, I, I, I just have concerns about this section because I don't see how it relates to what our goal was in sending this letter. I don't have, I don't share the same concerns regarding our special education budget necessarily. Um, 
just having three children who are in special education programs within the schools, I do understand the amount of staffing and services that go along with that. And I just feel like it was an unnecessary inclusion here. And I just think we could have been a little bit more concise and to the point with the communication. Um, are you, do you want to make a motion or do you want to? Well, I'm hoping to get, because, you know, I know Mandy Joe just said that that came from one counselor's concern. And so I'm trying to gauge like are other counselors also very concerned about this and want to include it because this is not exactly where my concern was going or coming from in terms of the position we're in with the budget. I think my concern was a little bit more structural in terms of the fact that we're even in this position in the first place, that there should have been some type of system or mechanism in place for us to prevent this from happening. And so what are we doing moving forward? What plan do we have? Um, I know we have a new superintendent coming on board, but I still think that the regional school committee can be, you know, starting to craft an outline of a plan. And I think that I was hoping that this document would convey that to them, that it is crit critical that they have a plan. And I just think that this is not what this says. Councillor Haneke. I was not the counselor on the finance committee that initially requested this be in there, but I am in total support of it because I do actually think, and I will say it out loud, that um, the increase in SPED staffing, while this number of students enrolled with disabilities has remained essentially unchanged is part of the structural problem that needs discussed. Um, I'd like to make a few observations. Um, first of all, I'm delighted with the last paragraph. It, it states our strong support of the schools and our willingness to work with people. Some of you may be aware that the school committee has voted to form their own committee to look at this. And I hope that that committee and this will jive in a way that is very constructive and moves forward. Over the years, as long as I can remember being on the council and previously on the finance committee for five years, we have looked at this issue and said, it's going in the wrong direction. And we need to start talking much earlier in the year than at the December four towns meeting. And what this letter does is actually call for that. And it asks for us to share this with the other three partners in our town. So the fact that we bring this back to the budget message from the manager, the fact that we bring it back with a date knowing that the new superintendent is coming board on July 1. This letter I'm hoping is seen as a reaching out and saying, let's work together, not we're working against you. And so I want to thank the people for putting this together. There may be things I would change about the letter, but frankly, I don't feel the need to get into that. Um, so, um, I just really wanted to say that to me, this is not a letter. This is a letter that's been long in coming. This is a letter that we've needed for probably the last three or four years. And it's, we've let it get to a crisis point. We're seeing what's happening in Northampton. It's very unpleasant. And uh, what I would like, and what I hope for Amherst is that we can all sit down and work this out together for the benefit of all of our children. Um, Thank you, George. So that's a little bit back to my concern earlier that by voting the 6%, we create, at least in some people's minds, the, the sense, perhaps I would call it the illusion that there's all this money out there and all they have to do is ask for it and we can find a way to, to hand it over. I would say that the most important paragraph in this letter, for me at least, is paragraph number five. Um, which I feel bear with me for a moment, I'm going to read um, for the audience, if no one else watching and listening. 
At the recent BGC meeting, BCG meeting, Amherst staff presented a budget projections based on a few scenarios. These projections show that Amherst anticipated revenues will be pressed to sustain a modest 2.5% year over year increase in the four functional area budgets. Projecting out 4% growth to each major functional area results in deficits that even marginal improvements in revenue projections will not be able to resolve. As the deficit started over 1.5 million in FY26, point that I made earlier, um, and will rise to 5.8 million in fiscal year 29. So I think it's simply laying out the financial reality and um, helping them see that um, the fact that we've given this 2% increase this year um, is not something that's sustainable. Councilor Lord. Thank you. Um, I'm just having a feeling around this letter. Um, I appreciate the details, um, but last meeting, it seemed like there were some counselors that distrust our elected officials, the school committee, and I'm, I would, whereas there's, I'm just trying to understand that a little. So to me, if our president says we should have been talking about this three or four years ago, um, and it's been coming and we've seen it, I feel like this letter feels a little punitive to me. Um, and I would, I would love a letter that said, let's set a date really soon so we can sit together and dialogue about the things that are written in the letter. I don't know. I just wanted to voice that, um, that I really support our school committee. I want to fund our schools. I wish it wasn't such a desperate situation all around the country for our public education and here in Amherst. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. Pat? Uh, yeah, a minor. Uh, as a former educator, I have to step in to counselor and stand with counselor Walker about special education students. Uh, the, the special education staffing has increased, but the number of students, special education has decreased, has dropped 3%. 3% is very small. And the services that a student needs, they're not, um, they're not consistent per student. So a student with disabilities might require a great deal of teacher um, and paraprofessional support um, throughout the day where another special needs students would need less. So I don't think this is a place, um, I'm not, I think it needs to be there, but I think that Councillor Haneke has to realize that it's not simply the numbers when you're dealing with special education students and staff. Um, and I, it, it really, um, it's really important to understand that and to really open yourself to more than just the numbers in this particular situation. And I support this letter, so I'm not uh, opposing it going out, but I am concerned when I hear that kind of response um, based only on number and I'm repeating myself. Thank you. Councilor Walker. Um, thank you. So I think <clears throat> I really like the way that Councillor Lord stated some of her concerns. And I think that I would also like to, you know, more formally use this as an opportunity to, to be in continued conversation with the regional school committee. And I think like Councillor Lord said, setting a time to talk with them where there can be like an open-ended back and forth dialogue where these questions can be answered. Um, I also would personally prefer the discussion about special, special education happen at that time. Um, I do think it's like an important conversation to have. I just don't see why this is the main, like why this is one of the main points in this communication. Um, and so I would prefer to take that entire section out. Um, I think the other sections get to the point just fine. And I think we should, again, open this up for continued dialogue and that maybe we can have a meeting together and that can be one of the talking points on the agenda to go over whatever concerns we have in that section and to get some live responses. But I, I would prefer to move forward in that way. 
Bob Hagner. Um, uh, Councillor uh, Lord and Councillor Walker, uh, the, if you look at the last, the second to last paragraph, we ask that we, we, we first step would be for the regional school committee to engage in discussions among all four towns to understand our ability to su support education in our municipalities and in the region. Is that not, is that, does that get to what you want or is that not getting to what you want? in terms of a, of a discussion. I mean, I'm happy to, to, to reword this sentence in, in a way to make it more, uh, more inviting, um, if that's what you are asking. While people think about that, I'm gonna go on to Councillor Haneke. I was going to point out the same thing um, Councillor Hegner just did about we're actually asking the district to convene a discussion by August 1 on these structural issues, mm -hmm. um, which I think I've been hearing Councillor Walker and Lord say it should ask for. And so I, I it's in there unless it's not in there the way they want it to be. Um, thank you, Councillor DeAngelis, on the SPED issues. I, I understand that each student is different. Um, I think our town has had a hesitancy to even bring up the issue of um, the cost of special education in our town, um, which is why I believe it's important to be in here. We've struggled with as a council, at least I have in the past five years, getting more information about those costs and why they are so high. Um, and this, yes, yeah, statistics are just statistics, right? But I think it goes to wanting that information as to why the student enrollments are basically flat. Um, so why has staffing gone up that much? Is it because they are needier than in past years or is it some other reason? And we haven't, when we ask those questions, what we get a lot is, well, the percentage has just gone up. We don't, we don't get that dig in into real reasons why we just get that overall 10,000 view of, but we have more SPED students in percentage than other districts. And I think the, the, the importance of this chart is trying to dig into just picking one area, right? There are plenty of other areas, regular instructions down 18%, but the student enrollment is down 27%. That's also a mismatch um, in a sense. Um, you know, there's a lot of mismatches in here um, and trying to keep a letter succinct, but also point out some things that we really do want to dig in, want the school district to dig into more because that's where we have concerns say, that doesn't mean that's where, the structural issues need to be fixed, right? That that that's not what I'm trying to say at all. But we can't we can't shy away from those tough conversations in areas where I feel in my five years on the council we have shied away from. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Councillor Ette. Um. So. I noticed the conversation has been, excuse me. Um, I noticed the conversation has been more about the town and the school district, but I did see that we copied the other towns mm -hmm. on this letter. And so I'm wondering what is, what are we looking to influence with regard to the other towns? So put in a different way, if there was a letter from any of the other towns, the way we're writing this, how would the Amherst Town Council take that letter into consideration going forward? Um, Councillor Ette, I'm going to actually respond to that. If somebody from another town had contacted us and said, we're concerned, we would like to talk about the budgets for the regional schools and its affordability, then I think we would be obliged to meet with them and have that conversation. And that's what I'm hoping this is seen as, is an invitation for everybody to talk. I don't, I, I wouldn't be offended at all if a town sent us something that said, we'd like to talk. 
um, I think that we have put off that talk too long. Um, I do want to go back to one item, and that is that I distinctly remember uh, former Superintendent Mike Morris explaining to us a significant change that was made in special education in, in Amherst a couple of years ago. And it was an attempt to have more students with greater needs served within the district versus paying tuition out. And while I don't know if that explains this or not, I just want to say that as a finance committee member, I did hear that very loud and clear when we were in the process, both of the budget and that later on when we were dealing with the design for the new elementary school. Uh, Councilor Ryan. So one of the peculiarities of our system is that one elected body basically is keepers of the purse and another elected body is responsible for education. And so it easily can become a scenario in which we get to play the bad guy and it's easy to point the finger at us and call us anti-education or anti-teacher, whatever, because we have to deal with a balanced budget and we have to look at the economic and fiscal realities. Imagine a system in which the the uh, school committee presented their budget directly to the voters and the voters then voted on it. Um, they could then make their case and the voters would decide. Um, we don't have that system. I think this is something maybe like what New York has, but Andy knows better than I. But anyway, we don't have that system. What we have is a system in which we say, here are the economic realities. Here are the economic limits. You must work within these constraints. Uh, we don't just make them up arbitrarily. They're based on an enormous amount of work and, and care. I think the greatest disservice we, will, we can do to our students and to our teachers and to our paraprofessionals is not to be honest with them about the economic realities. And that's what we're trying to do. And we are certainly inviting a dialogue, and I hope that they will take that opportunity um, and, and enter into that dialogue. But here we're just trying to lay out some of the economic realities, which I think is actually our responsibility. And that doesn't make us anti-educator, doesn't make us anti-student, um, doesn't make us anti-teacher. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Yeah, uh, as far as uh, Councillor Walker's uh, observation at the beginning, and I appreciate her uh, statement, it, I, I'm hoping, and I read, the, read that several times as I was going through it because I'm well aware of the um, problems with funding special education and the high costs and the unknown costs and the, and the significant costs. Um, it, it's a, but it is a significant portion of the budget and it's become an increasing portion of the budget sort of on a continuous basis. And I guess the, what it was um, I wanted to do was make the observation but not suggest an action. And uh, because I think that the decision is to what to do to address what Councillor Brian just said, that we don't have an infinite supply of money to continue to fund in a greater and greater amount each year. Um, and the, But the decision on how to approach that um, problem is really the school committee's responsibility our responsibility is what this letter is intended to do, which is to just sort of make a statement very clearly and an explanation very clearly that there is a limit and that the limit um, comes from the fact that there are a lot of pressures on municipal budget and uh, there's a cap on the amount that we have to spend additional each year and um, that cap is essentially the two and a half percent that um, comes from the initiative that was passed by voters way back in 1980 but is still living us and haunting us on a daily basis or annual basis i should say the other thing that i wanted to share with you is um I did do some um, research on the 20 year decrease in enrollment and looked to compare it. And I was thinking about it because we've been hearing a lot about 
Northampton, and um, it, it's uh, which is covered in the paper. I just wanted to share with you that the outcome of my research, which is based solely on statistics from uh, DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, is that during that last 20 year period, as has been observed, the regional budget, uh, the regional enrollment has decreased by 41%. The Amherst Elementary enrollment has decreased by 33%. But when we look across the river, um, that their enrollment has decreased in a K-12 district, so it combines the two statistically, so you can't break it apart by um, the way that we do, but it was 16%. And um, we know the kinds of anxiety that is going on in Northampton, and I just want to to report that because I think as we sit here and saying, why are we agonizing over it so much that we need to uh, also remind ourselves that uh, there are other factors. And uh, I think you know, for all that we're reading in North about what's going on in Northampton, you know, their decline in enrollment is, uh, you know, half of ours or even a little less than half. So just wanted to add that. Councillor Haneke. Um, I just wanted to respond to Councillor Ette's comments. The, the other reason to send this and, and copy the other towns is because of that second to last paragraph where we say we ask the district to convene a discussion by August 1. That discussion is meant not to be just with our town, but with all the towns. So those towns I think need to see that request so that they know we've made that request. Kathy? In addition to that, uh, Councillor Ette, what our hope is we would be sending it to their select board and their finance committees. So they're, every single one of the four towns is facing a huge stretch to pay for their schools. Um, when I first ran, one of the towns was approaching the total limit um, of their assessed value, literally gonna top out where they couldn't increase anymore. With the two, they were at two and a half percent of the total town property values. And at that point you can't go up. So, so we're under a lot of stretch, stress in our regional budget. I do think um, the concerns that uh, Alicia has raised, I mean, I, I want to go back and read it for tone um, because I think the intention is to get together and try to figure out with the school committee leading what can be done um, and how it can be done. But I would really like us to do an, a very different kind of letter because if I look at these numbers and Andy looked over to Northampton, if I look at the Chinese Emergent School, they don't take severely disabled, and their percent with disabilities around 10%. So the students we're losing is, is not the special needs population. We're losing about 200 others um, that are they're going out of our system. And the dynamic that's been really crippling is that we're cutting down on the choice of languages, the, the music program, the other kinds of programs. So parents are, some parents are pulling their kids out of our system, not because they don't wanna have, be in our public schools. And so trying to figure out how to combat that. And we set up the Comandantes program in our elementary school to say we can be, have a unique, attractive program. And it's been extraordinarily successful in doing that. People are really wanting to do that. And we want to make sure our regional system, if the kids come up being dual language, that they still have a language program that they can go to. So I think the intent is strong support of our educational system and trying to figure out what we can do together. So I would like us to work on a separate letter to our representatives with other towns saying we are being crippled by a drain on public education, and this is coming from the state. 
Um, and it's what I've heard is some of the Boston schools are experienced the same thing. It's not just our area no. around charter. Um, so I wanted to gather a few of them because I think we desperately need that as a fix because the dynamic is is a really uh, a uh, crippling one, and this is happening to South Hadley. I was looking at where the drain is coming from South Hadley and from different towns around our area. So we happen to have one particular charter school that's like a private school, that the performing arts school is very different. They get a very diverse mix of kids and take kids that don't fit as well in a more traditional system, and you can see it in their statistics. So I think we need to take a different kind of action that brings unity where we are fighting for a change. If it can't come next year, fine, but we need to really raise our voices strongly on this. Councilor Walker. Um, thank you, Kathy, for that, because I feel also very strongly about that. And that may be where all of what I'm about to share is heading, but I, I do agree with George in terms of we're trying to communicate and be honest about what our fiscal realities are. And I, I do feel like in the first like page or so, it feels like that's what we're doing. Like we're being very clear about what position we're in fiscally and our ability to contribute. There are a couple of sentences that I feel don't do that. Um, but like I said, in the first page or so, I feel like that's where we're headed. And then there are a few and maybe it's just wording that makes me feel uncomfortable with it, but we urge the region to begin the budget process, assuming Amherst and other towns are not going to be able to provide. I feel like that sentence is strange because we're giving them the picture of our fiscal realities. I don't think we need to now demand them that when they're starting their next, next budget process, they assume we are not going to give anything else and the other towns. And so that also feels a little bit weird because we're speaking for the other towns. So just that one sentence, but then I start again to get uncomfortable with the portion about uh, the special education because that's when we start to talk about their budget as opposed to our budget and our fiscal realities. Um, and we start to talk about the way in which they're using and spending their money, which I just, again, feel like is unnecessary if our goal is to not be instructing them to do stuff, um, which is also the reason why I might have a, an issue with the wording about a first step is for the regional school committee to engage in discussion among all four towns. Again, it sounds like we're just telling them what to do as opposed to we invite you to be in discussion with us. Um, I don't see an issue sending this to all four towns. I would, of course, want them to be in discussion with all four towns. I would hope that as elected officials that that's what they would do. I, I don't think we need to instruct them to do that, but I think we can invite them to be in conversation with us. Um, and I think that that's what I would like for us to do. And again, I think just the wording of we want them, we want to engage in discussion because we want them to understand our ability to support them um, and, and the other town's abilities to do so. Um, but I think the issue is bigger than that because I don't think it's that the school committee assumes that we have endless dollars and they can continue to come back and ask us for more and more money. I think the reality of the situation, and a lot of this is what Kathy alluded to, is that our schools need more funding, our youth need more resources, and especially still coming out of COVID, like the, our schools are still in crisis. I'm not sure if we're realizing the realities of what it's looking like day to day inside of our schools, but they're not asking us for this money for fun. This is a real issue and it's affecting the youth in our town. We need the, the support positions. We need the programming. Our kids need these things. And maybe the reality is that the town doesn't have the money and that's maybe the reality we in, we're in, but we need to be strategically thinking about how we can support the youth in our town who genuinely need these things regardless of whether or not we have the money. And so what can we do then? And so I, again, I just feel like maybe it's the tone and I don't feel like the letter is giving the message that I had hoped. 
I'm not, I'm, I'm totally in favor of sending a letter. I like the first page. I think it's strong. I, I have some wording changes I would like. I don't know if that's too much to do right now in terms of amendments, but I, I think that we're not sending the message, at least I intended to send to the school committee. And I think it's a bit, I just don't like the tone, honestly. Well, in order to change something, we're gonna need suggested changes and they're gonna have to come in the form of, you know, I don't, I hate to go through an amendment process, but nevertheless suggested changes, but we do, have, and we are not meeting again until the 15th. And so I don't see us delaying the letter until then. So Jennifer. Okay, well, one of, part of what I was gonna say is to suggest that is there a way for to a couple of counselors to work? No. Nope. We have to no. do that. breaks open meeting law. Okay. Uh, well, wasn't the letter written out? Did two counselors write this? They wrote it. One person drafted it and more per people at it in an open meeting. In an open meeting. Okay. Correct. I was tasked with drafting it. I volunteered to draft it. And then I consulted Kathy before I brought it to the council because I had questions and I wanted to make sure before it was put public in a public packet, even in draft form, that it had a, a tone and the information that was. So I consulted Kathy. She gave me some suggestions. I was fully in charge of all the edits. It went to a committee. At that point, the committee discussed it. They had some changes. It came back with a vote from that committee to give me the full authority to take those suggestions, make the changes and bring the letter to the council. So it was only ever right. under my authority to not break open meeting law. Okay. And with a vote of the committee to be able to do that and forward it to the council for tonight's discussion. Thank you. And I just, this is for another conversation, but I can't, Andy's um, very important um, statistic go unresponded to, which is in Northampton, their enrollment has decreased by 16% and in Amherst between 33 and 41%. That is something we need to look at. I mean, that is substantial. Um, in 2018, the regional school committee had an enrollment committee with a declining enrollment working group and we may want to, or I don't know if it'd be the council or the school committee, but somebody may want to revisit that because part of what they pointed to in that report was decline, the decline in families that live in Amherst. And that is very much evident in this, in this stark difference in our large decline in enrollment. And certainly when we compare it to a town almost next door. So. Councilor Haneke. I want to respond to Councillor Shane's um, comments on charter schools. First of all, he almost only, and the council as a whole, almost only ever men mentions the Chinese charter school, never mentions the other charter schools that our students go to. I'm not sure why, but it's very frustrating that particularly when we're talking about a region that sends very few in the grades 7 to 12 to PVCI, but send very many to PVPA that we don't ever mention really PVPA. Um, but I wanna, uh, so it's not just the Chinese school, but the claims that the Chinese school does not accept students with disabilities are false. The Chinese school is under obligation of state law to when they have applications as with any charter school, when they have applications exceeding the number of spots available to do a lottery, and they admit the names they draw from that lottery, anyone can submit to the lottery. And the Chinese school or any other charter school, if a name is drawn from the lottery, cannot say no to that person, no matter the level of their disability or speaking ability in any language. Although I believe the Chinese school's charter does allow um, potential to for um, non-English first language students, but that's by state law. I and really state want to draw but, to the letter. But it goes to the letter because what people are saying at this council 
is that it's the charter schools that are problems, but they only mention one charter school and then they give false information as to what that charter school can do and can't do. And that's a problem. We need to not be trading in false information about what charter schools can and can't do. Andy. Yeah, we seem to be circling around on different subjects, but I wanted to just uh, come back to something that has been raised before and that is the uh, sort of recognition that this is a four town region and that one of the things that we wanna do, and I think is um, there are uh, people um, on uh, select boards and finance committees in the other towns who are aware of uh, what we're right, uh, doing with the letter and are looking forward to receiving a copy and uh, wanna try and uh, link what their communications are to what our communications are, and they're looking for for leadership. But um, we need to ultimately recognize that we do have a four town region, and in the end, we're going to have to have a budget that is agreed to by the four towns based upon what they can afford, and is going to um, start with. Um, as it always does, a um, four towns meeting where we talk about what resources we have available and what the school's needs are. And it's important that we get the communication across that that can't wait, <laughs> that it's really important that we begin that discussion for the next um, fiscal year as soon as possible. I would like to start at the summer. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't even wait until the fall because I exactly don't right. think that we, that there's any information that we don't n now know. And um, the reality is that, you know, as much as we're concerned about the fact that we have very limited commercial um, and uh, industrial base in that we're entirely, almost entirely residential. Just remember what our three partner communities are like in the region. Uh, they're all residential. Uh, and uh, yeah. so, you know, their problem is as great or greater than ours. And uh, so we do, I, I, I would like to have the letter be done tonight, be out tonight, get to the other towns and get to the school committee and begin this discussion because we need to communicate to the school committee exactly what the, the draft has been put together to do, that there's a limit on resources and the limit on resources uh, is that the annual growth is not matching what the annual growth is in school budgets, that this is a continuous problem. It is not a new problem, and we want to draw their attention to it. And the other comment that I want to make is that I feel uh, that there is um, something that we do need to be compassionate to what's going on with the current school committee, um, because there's a tremendous number of new members and uh, it was sort of an unfortunate set of circumstances that caused us to lose the superintendent and then uh, lose a number of school committee members across the region because of what happened. And uh, as a consequence, they're just beginning to catch up in their understanding of what the reality is on budgets and how budgets work. And I think that this letter, as it's drafted, goes a long way to sort of increasing that understanding and putting some real numbers behind it. So I really hope that we come out with a strong letter tonight and just get this done. Pat? Uh, yes, two, two things. One, well, three things. I support this letter. And I want to say that in the next to the last paragraph, it says, Given these concerns and realities, we hope and request 
So I feel like it is not saying you better do what I want you to do. I think that it is, there is a softness there that's real, we hope. The other thing I want to address is decline in families. Rents are so high in our town and that um, a woman I taught with who is a single mom, divorced, has two children, cannot afford to stay in Amherst. And you're nodding your head, and that's excellent because it's real. But the very um, ways that we erected exclusionary zoning keeps young families being able to move here, to afford to live here. So there are several elements that are, uh, um, most of them financial, that are affecting our moment. And until those of you who go, yes, 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 actually look at zoning and density, we're not gonna change anything. I need to respond, can I? I, I really, we need to get back to yes. the letter. Okay. One response, Jennifer, go ahead, but I, this has gone way okay. beyond what the letter is. No, it has everything to do with how much housing are, how much housing is. And because we have so many investors who are outbidding families and are charging very high rents by the bedroom. So I, I, would, I don't know what we were disagreeing about. Change zoning laws. Right, okay, here's my bottom line. I, if you want major changes like exclusions in this letter, you have to make a motion. If you want to suggest to me some softening here and there after the meeting and the council gives me the authority to do that, I will look at those and make some decisions. But otherwise there is a motion on the table. It's been made and it's been seconded. Question's been called. And I second it. Okay. Uh, we are going to vote, right? Yes, calling the question, right. Okay, and we're going to begin with Councilor Ryan. Yes. This is the vote to call the question. Uh, Kathy Shane. Yes, this Andy is just Steinberg. call the question. This is call the question. Yes. Jennifer Top. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Ette. Yes. Lynn Griesmers and I. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Yes. Uh, Councillor Lord. Aye. 